Friday, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. If you're new, I want to let you know that Savvy Sabs Podcast is a part of Revolutionary Blackout Network. You can catch me there on Thursdays for the Savvy and JB show, and you can catch me here on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and every other Sunday. Welcome back, fam. Let's give a shout out to everyone watching on YouTube, Rockfin, and Rumble. We have so much to discuss tonight. It has been a pretty eventful week, uh, to say the least. Uh, we do actually have a uh, Professor Zinkus, I believe, is going to be joining us for the Columbia University uh, protest story, uh, because Professor Zinkus is actually uh, a professor at uh, Columbia. But let's go ahead and show that thumbnail to show you what else we are going to discuss tonight. We'll go ahead and put that up on the screen, guys. All right, all right. Tonight, we are discussing, if you have not heard, I don't know where you have been, but we are discussing Israel attacks Iran. Big one, big one. That happened last night. We're going to dive into that and what it could mean uh, for the future of the Middle East going forward. We are also going to discuss Dave Smith and Batya debate panel. Oh, my God. That was a doozy. So we're getting to that story, debate about Israel and Gaza. RFK surprise, something has happened with RFK Jr.'s campaign. And I don't just mean <laughs> the campaign itself, but there's a lot happening here. And I'm going to tell you what I think may happen going forward because of the pressure that the campaign is receiving. And of course, we are also going to discuss the Columbia protest uproar. For Columbia University, so much has been happening there. So I'm excited to dive into all of that. I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out to Savvy Patrons as well. You're in the house, holding down the fort, doing the damn thing. Let's go ahead and share the patrons. If you're interested in being a sad, uh, patron, I said a sad. If you're interested in being a Savvy Patron, I have five categories. Ultimate sabinators there's also sabsters of course don't forget about those sabbies they hold down the fort too guys that's right they hold down the fort too and of course members all of their names are listed here you can also see their names scrolling across the bottom of the screen on the ticker and i do need to adjust those newbies because i did shout them out already so yeah, guys, so much to discuss tonight. Hope you are pumped for that. I'm going to go ahead and give shout outs to people in the chat. Let's start off with that. Let's start off with that. Shout out to Mastermind Hour says, love, love, love the new thumbnail look. Thank you so much. Changing things around here. You're going to notice the clip thumbnails are also changing. We're doing some different things. It's a new year, new things. Shout out to Miguel says, peace and happy Friday. Greetings, Lawrence Johnson says, BB, wipe that stupid smirk off your face. Okay. Shout out to New York Varsity says, great convo yesterday, shooby dooby doo. Greetings, uh, kill your Grogers says, till Sabby starts. Okay. And shout out to uh, Thon says, what's up, y'all? All good in the hood like it should. I believe Professor Zinkus is here. Whenever you're ready, Professor Zinkus, I'll go ahead and bring you onto the screen. Just give me a thumbs up. All right. All right, guys, we are going to dive into 
the Columbia University protest story that has been all the buzz uh, recently. Joining me to discuss that is Professor Anthony Zinkus. He actually teaches at Columbia University. So welcome back, Professor Zinkus. Hey, great to be here, Sabi. How you doing? And your coverage has been amazing. So it keeps me sane. Thanks, you, thanks for your work. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, Professor Zinkis, um, I'm pretty sure you're aware you teach at Columbia University. I actually saw this from Breakthrough News. Update, a massive group of students have surrounded the Columbia University Palestine Solidarity encampment to express their support for the protesters. So we can see there's an encampment here uh, around Columbia University. I, I want to get your take on this, uh, Professor Zinkis. Uh, first and foremost, let's go back a little bit for people who may have forgotten. There was an attack uh, uh, on the Palestinian protesters uh, okay. prior to this event. I believe this was like a month or so ago. There was an attack by other students, correct? Let's start with that and then we'll work our way forward. Yeah, it was a pretty serious attack too. There was a pro-Palestine uh, student demonstration on Columbia's main campus. Uh, well, there've been a bunch, but the one we're talking about was J uh, J January 19th. And uh, at that protest, a number of students said that they uh, smelled a very, very noxious, foul odor and some of them were sickened by it, and multiple students had to seek medical attention. A couple of them were hospitalized. And based on the description of what it was, the belief is it may have been, it hasn't been proven, uh, something called skunk, which is a military-grade chemical weapon developed by and used by the uh, IDF, for crowd control in Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, it's serious, and if you look up a uh, skunk weapon, uh, it is it, it can cause nausea, headaches, dizziness. Um, uh, in addition to a noxious odor that is designed not to easily uh, get out of hair or clothing, students had to throw away clothing. And uh, again, this was serious. Some were medically treated. The one of the more odorous, onerous things about skunk is that it lasts for a while, as do the symptoms. So students had symptoms for weeks, days, and weeks. And the and the you know the, the problem with this is now there were two students that were identified by multiple videos who allegedly were students at Columbia University and former IDF. So they were veterans of Israel's military who were going to school at Columbia, uh, that they may have perpetrated this. One of them right now is suing the university because I believe they were, they're being investigated or may have been suspended. But the last thing, don't quote me on, there have been no formal disciplinary actions that have been made public. The NYPD, of course, this is a chemical attack. It's, I mean, literally a, t a terrorist attack. And um, NYPD says they're still investigating. Now, this is three months later. Can you imagine if the situation were reversed? If there right. was a pro-Israel demonstration, and there have been on campus, so you know, the pro-Palestine students and faculty are completely understanding and fine with the fact that people want to express their solidarity with Israel. We leave them alone. That's not our interest. Our interest is getting the word out to campus and to the world that there is a genocide going on and that before this current genocide, the occupation, the apartheid state, the dehumanization of the Palestinian people um, has been unacceptable and we want something done about it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's pretty horrible. And I can tell you this, students that I've spoken to have been traumatized by that event. You know, it's one thing to be shouted out, demeaned and called names. We, we understand that can happen at a demonstration, but to be attacked like this and then to feel the university, the intercept covered it nicely. 
The university's first response was to blame the students for an unauthorized protest, and which is just horrible and sad. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate. I I I, I remember when I first heard about that incident, and I'm like, that is that's scary because they could use that at any demonstration, not just Columbia University. They could go to another demonstration in New York and also use the same the same chemical. So that's concerning. Uh, mainstream media has been covering the protests that are happening at Columbia. I want to bring up uh, this clip here from ABC News. We're going to play part of this, and I want to get your take on this as well. Protests are underway at colleges across the country over the Israel-Hamas war, and one of the biggest is at Columbia University in New York where several people have been arrested. Pro-Palestinian protesters are demanding that that university's board of trustees cut all funding ties with weapons manufacturers that supply Israel. Dozens of pro-Israel demonstrators have also gathered following testimony from the university's president, Manush Shafiq, before a House committee over the school's handling of anti-Semitism. Trying to reconcile the free speech rights of those who wanted to protest and the rights of Jewish students to be in an environment free of discrimination and harassment has been the central challenge on our campus and numerous others across the country. Let's let's talk about her for just a second, Professor Zinkis, because she is the president of the university. Uh, if anything, she should be responsible for making sure those students were reprimanded, the ones that uh, chose to use chemicals. But this hearing that she had uh, in front of Congress, they basically got her to agree uh, with that. Some of the slogans that students have been chanting are considered to be anti-Semitic. Uh, what is your take on that? Uh, her role as president of the university and then also the encampments that are going on at Columbia. Well, the first thing, and I think, I know we both agree that anti-Semitism, real anti-Semitism is vile and dehumanizing. And so like any type of racism or bigotry or, or hate falls under the same category. So in a university of that size, if that ever happens, if somebody's a victim of any type of anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, it's horrible needs to be stopped, it needs to be dealt with. But what I'm hearing and what we've been hearing, especially from a particular faculty member who's um, been very out there as far as being pro-Israel and being very anti-student protest, uh, is that the mere existence of these demonstrations is offensive and unacceptable to some on the pro-Israel side. And uh, they are equating on campus and sadly nationally, because I, I think you covered it, you know, they, Congress just passed a condemnation of the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Mm -hmm. um, I believe saying that it's anti-Semitic. Those things are not anti-Semitic. And like we, it's as if this is the, this is where we have to start pinching ourselves to see if we're crazy or not, right? Because every day we're seeing posts and seeing media saying this and politicians and pundits, and we're like, you know, we are uh, anyone in the world, but we as Americans are free to criticize any government, including our own. And that doesn't mean we hate anybody. So calls, and I just want to be clear, calls for the liberation of Palestine calls to end the slaughter are in no way hatred of Jewish people. And as evidence, student uh, voices of Jewish students, uh, Jewish Voices for Peace on Columbia campus, along with Students for Justice in Palestine, were, were fully banned by the university last semester. So there are so many voices, including Jewish voices, that understand that what is happening, that what Israel has been doing and is doing in Gaza and the West Bank is not just genocide, right? It's uh, not just land grabs. Uh, it is just a fully, it, probably the most inhumane thing we've witnessed or one of the most inhumane things we've witnessed in our lifetimes. There, there's nothing anti-Semitic 
or anti-Jewish about standing up for the rights of Palestinian people. Right. Uh, and the, the fact that the, that the administration did not strongly come out um, and say that is disappointing in the least. Right. Right. Well, a lot of this goes back to uh, donors. There's a lot of donors that donate to these institutions and these presidents trying to keep the position that they have. It's, it's just really crazy. I, my call to the students would be to stage a huge walkout uh, so that, you know, you can really feel the effect here because the students do have some power. They have power, the power of numbers. So if they were to stage a huge walkout and you don't have the students in the classroom, then the professors don't really have anyone to teach. And then this goes to, to the salary issue. So the thing is, the students are the customers of the university. Without the students, the university doesn't have a customer base. Without a customer base, the university cannot continue to operate. And so I, I think it's, it's really uh, interesting to me that the way that they're responding to these students as if they don't need customer, as if they don't need them when they really do need them. And I saw like some of the protests that were happening at Columbia. Uh, it's been all over the news the past uh, two days. A number of people have been there. I'll show us a couple of those clips in just a second. But I, I, I've noticed to me, it's just like the way they're talking about the students that are part of the protests. Have some of them forgotten about the students that protested against the Vietnam War? Not only that, I mean, so Columbia is famous for that. 1968, they took uh, they took over students and faculty took over. I think three buildings on main campus. When I say main campus, people have to understand Columbia University is, if not the biggest, one of the biggest real estate holders in New York City. So they have property all over Manhattan, but on the main campus, uh, the, in 68 they took over buildings. Um, and also, Columbia was instrumental in 1985 and 86 in the move for divestment from South Africa. In fact, I think they were the first university to divest from corporate. So there's precedent here with apartheid and the apartheid system in Israel. I mean, South Africa was horrible. And what's happening in Israel, Gaza, West Bank, Palestine is horrible as well. And I just want to give a, a, a thing about what happened with, with what students did do, because the university, since the protests began in the second week of October, has been kind of surreptitiously changing the rules of protest. So all of a sudden, something is unauthorized. You didn't know it was unauthorized. And one thing I want to say about that, genocide doesn't operate on a schedule. Protesting can't be expected to either. So if there's like the slaughter of those poor folks in Gaza who were running to get the food truck and they were just slaughtered by the IDF, like you can't predict that. Of course, there's going to be a protest after it. School cannot expect students to wait two weeks for an application. That's not how free speech works. So what happened is when um, President Shafiq testified before Congress on Wednesday of this week, Students snuck onto the main campus in the uh, early morning hours and set up that tent encampment, which you showed briefly. I'm sure you have more photos of. That was uh, the liberated zone known as the uh, Gaza Solidarity Encampment. So uh, yesterday, you know, with, within a day and a half then, they were told they had to take it down. The president in, uh, asked through a letter, a written letter to the NYPD, for cops to come on campus. So like, I was there Wednesday and the police presence on Broadway and on the streets, there was over a hundred police in riot gear for a bunch of nerds who were literally doing, and I say that with love because I'm one too, who were doing their homework on a lawn, some in tents, some out of the tents. And what ended up happening was the police came, made tons of arrests, and the way they were able to make the arrests was the university, because students had a right to be on that lawn. It's a free speech zone. This, the university suspended all of those students and then told the police, well, now they're trespassing because they're no longer students, which is just insane. So they arrested them. Those are students from Bernard and Columbia. And Bernard is a women's college that's part of Columbia. It's across the street. And uh, including Ilan Omar's daughter, who was there, 
uh, who's a student at Bernard. So they were all arrested. And then what happened was, and this is what I don't get. Like, I'm not trying to help the administration suppress speech. But if you do it this way, it's only going to get louder. And that's exactly what happened. Because hundreds of students then flooded the campus with a wall around the encampment. And as the NYPD arrested them, all these other students jumped over a fence to another lawn without the tents. And they are there to this day. They're there right now. And it's like five times the number, at least, that was originally there. And now they're attracting national attention. I'm sure you'll cover that, too. That's right. And and I want to get into uh, those arrests here because they actually covered that on ABC News. So this is getting a lot of national uh, attention here. New York here. City tonight protests and arrests at Columbia University. Here are the pictures. The NYPD, some officers in riot gear descending on Columbia, arresting dozens of pro-Palestinian demonstrators. It comes after the university president was called before Congress to address accusations of anti-Semitism on campus. ABC Stephanie Ramos tonight at Columbia. Tonight, NYPD officers descending on Columbia University, arresting dozens of pro-Palestinian protesters. I'm just standing here. Why are you doing this to me? Police, some in riot gear, moving in at the request of the university's president to clear demonstrators who set up a tent encampment, refusing to leave overnight, calling on Columbia to divest from companies with ties to Israel. The daughter of U.S. Representative Elon Omar saying she has been suspended from Barnard College for protesting at Columbia. Late today, demonstrators shutting down streets around the school. What brought you out here? Um, I was showing solidarity with the housing community and with Columbia, and I think it's horrific what the Israeli army is doing to the civilian population in Gaza. It comes just 24 hours after the president of Columbia was grilled on Capitol Hill over her handling of anti-Semitism on campus. You don't think there's evidence of anti-Semitism among professors on your faculty? We have seen some cases and there have been consequences. Dr. Manoush Shafiq is facing calls for her resignation. Many Jewish students say they are subjected to a hostile environment since the start of the war in Gaza. Thank you to the NYPD for dismantling the encampment. Since the October 7th attack in Israel, anti-Semitic incidents have tripled on college campuses, up 140 percent nationwide. From Let's pause here for a second. Uh, Professor Zink is number one. Uh, the uh, anti-Semitic uh, incidents on campus. Have you seen any evidence of that? And then also, have you seen that the environment at Columbia University, would you describe it as hostile? I think you have to unmute. <laughs> just you know you think i'd figure this out years years into this but um i haven't seen any anti-semitism and that does not mean it doesn't exist and if it happens and when it happens it's it's horrible and it needs to be dealt with uh, firmly but what i have been reading is that people are equating hearing these chants with anti-Semitism. So when when students chant globalize the intifada, intifada means resistance. And when they chant that, someone can say, well, that that's anti-Semitic. It is not. It is not anti-Jewish. It's about the liberation of a people. It's like saying Black Lives Matter is anti-white. No, it's anti-white supremacy, you know. Well, I, I just want to add to Palestinians are Semites. You know, right. it, it's a stupid word. You know, right? yeah, it's 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 hilarious to me when they use that phrase and they make it seem like uh, it's only Jewish people that are are Semites. That is not true. Uh, and anyone can look up this definition of the word for their self. But there were a couple of people that actually joined the students in solidarity. Uh, Susan Sarandon was yeah. one of uh, the, the the speakers that showed up actually to support the students. She's shown up to multiple things, but I want you guys to hear what she said here. That it is very important to have their voices heard. To have their voices heard. And that is their right in a democracy. And this is their right in a democracy. Especially in a place of education. Especially in a place of education. And supposedly higher thought. And supposedly higher thought. To be uh, attacked. To be attacked. With racism, with racism 
and intolerance and intolerance is not acceptable is not acceptable there are many many people there are many many people who stand with you who stand with you you must know that you inspire so many people you must know that you inspire so many people people who are afraid people who are afraid people who are old and afraid people who are old and afraid are looking to you are looking to you and your voices and your voices and your organization and your organization and your tenacity and your tenacity and your kindness and your kindness to make a difference in this situation to make a difference in this situation you give me hope you give me hope to me and so many people to me and so many people and in the end the truth will win and in the end the truth will win it's important at this point it's important at this point Okay. Uh, that was Susan Sarandon, but she wasn't alone. Uh, Norm Finkelstein also showed up. Uh, I believe Chris Malls also attended as well. Uh, yeah. There was something uh, Norm Finkelstein said here that I thought was really interesting. I just want to play this clip really quick as well. Now, Israeli Defense Forces, it is a genocidal army. Why are you allowed to have public support for a genocide, at this moment, a genocidal state and a genocidal army. Okay, the language doesn't seem as provocative. We support the idea. But the content, the content is 10,000 times more offensive and outrageous to any, so to speak, civilized mind and civilized heart than the from the river to the sea slogan and the only reason the only reason there is an argument about that slogan even though as i said i disagree with it but that's a separate matter whether i agree or disagree with it the only reason there is an argument about that slogan is because we have legitimized this notion that hurt feelings are grounds for stifling speech. And that to me is totally unacceptable. Yeah, so there was Norm Finkelstein there as well. Uh, Professor Zinkis, how long do you think that this will continue, that students continue to protest? I know they arrested over 100 students from what yeah. I understand. Yeah, and uh, and just so people know, when students are arrested, they, they were also suspended. They've lost their campus, off-campus housing. They've lost their meal cards. So... I, if people think all students at schools like Columbia are privileged and wealthy, it's not true. Right. So many of them are in scholarships um, and they, you know, if, to lose housing, to be told you have 24 hours to vacate housing, you no longer have a meal card. These students are, you've, you have unnecessarily put them in, in a, a traumatic crisis that's completely unnecessary. And if you look at these students, they were sitting on the lawn, listening. They were doing teach-ins. You know, there was no, in fact, that lawn was, it didn't impede people walking across campus and it didn't interfere with learning. So there's severe consequences for expressing speech. And as far as how, I don't, and again, this is my, you know, what I'm saying to any administration of any college that does this, if you think, brutal repression and suppression is going to get a desired result of silence, the opposite will happen. The students are saying they have no intention of leaving. So what about dialogue? The students, as well as faculty, not all faculty. And by the way, I will tell you this, there are faculty members who don't agree with me or the students on Israel and Gaza but who also don't believe the response of the administration of Columbia has been uh, reasonable. People, it's a university. People need to be able to speak 
And there needs to be dialogue. The university's response to this encampment should be dialogue. That's what they did with the, the students who were Jewish and pro-Israel, who felt that they were being wronged on campus. They spoke with them. So let there be dialogue. Students are demanding divestment. These, you know, these companies that are funding Israel's economy is not great. I think people know that. Mm -hmm. And they're depending on the weapons and the aid from the United States, from Germany, from other countries, but also investment from these companies. When you do boycotts, they work. And the, the point is to get policy change, to get transformative change. Um, with, well, you know, one thing I, I was going to add as well, I think that's really important is that you know, I, I worked in the university system for over 10 years. And part of the reason why I no longer work in the university system is because, again, like you think this is a place that you're going to, you know, attend and it's going to be this beacon of free speech. And, you know, this is where you're going to like find yourself, et cetera. But a lot of these universities are very conservative when it comes to the business side of things. A lot of it's not just Columbia University. A lot of the universities are also you know, in bed with those weapon contractors. And I think a lot of people may not be aware of that until you start looking at the funding. A lot of these universities are also take donations from the billionaire class who also support the state of Israel. Uh, when this started with Harvard University, I warned people it wasn't just going to end with Harvard. I warned people that this was going to also spread to other universities. And that was also my biggest fear because at the end of the day, the president of these universities, they're going to try to do whatever they can to keep their job uh, and, and maintain the status that they have within their social their social circle. And when you're the president of a school like Columbia University, Harvard University, you know, Stanford, these people are in certain social circles that we are not a part of. That's just the reality of the situation. So they put the pressure on the presidents. And remember who started all this. This all started with Bill Ackman putting that pressure on Claudine Gay uh, at Harvard University. And now you see Congress putting pressure on the president of Columbia University. I mean, when does it end? You know, <laughs> private universities are corporations first. People like myself, other dedicated faculty, um, are there because they believe in learning and education and praxis and especially you know those who are adjuncts and part-time you know we don't we don't get paid what full professors make but all, we're there because we believe in it strongly and we love it that is not what the board of trustees of any private university or mm, of mo of many private universities centers as most important. It's their endowments. So when you look at places like Princeton and Harvard and Yale and Columbia, um, Stanford, all of them, the, their endowments, that's are worth billions of dollars. And so we go about our world, you know, we teach, you know, the students come and they learn and they're involved in what's going on. That is one small part of what corporate universities do. Um, and, and I just think it's, it, it, you know, so, and of course, what companies are going to want to put their tentacles in there? Big pharma, right? And they do. So that's where a lot of research comes. Weapons industry. And it, it's just those, who's going to be the chair of the, of, the, of the special chair set up by Monsanto or, well, they're not called that, they're bare now. Right. right. That, so that's where, and so research dollars get channeled by these massive corporations so they control research they control thought uh, and it's it's insidious and it's a, it's a real shame you're right. Well, Professor Zinkis, thank you so much uh, for your time. Good luck. I know it's a doozy. I know how higher ed can be, but uh, hopefully the students do prevail because uh, we cannot have this continue where these these presidents are threatened by Congress. And then they just instead of protecting the students or the students that are protesting, they protect themselves. Can, can I say one one final thing? And thank you for having me on about this. I think people are underestimating. I think the administration and the donors are gonna underestimate 
what breaking up that encampment this week, what the ripple effects are. I think that I'm already seeing other schools start to imitate it and put up tents. University of North Carolina, I think I saw something on Twitter about, I believe this will be one of those seminal events that echoes through the Palestinian, Palestinian liberation movement globally. And I think it's going to have profound effects. So I just want to say I have a profound respect um, and gratitude to the students who are sacrificing so much um, and they're just incredible. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Zinkis. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, guys. That was Professor Anthony uh, Zinkis. Very informative there. I, I, I warned you guys about this. Like when it started with Harvard University, I warned you that this was only going to spread to other universities. Uh, other university presidents were going to be threatened as well, as well. And not just in reference to their job, but, you know, if you're fired as the, uh, uh, the president of a university, unless you still have a actual professor position at that university, you know, that's not easy to really come back from. And a lot of these, these deans and presidents of the universities, they all run in the same circle. So they have conferences that they attend. So they may know presidents of colleges in California. If you live in Massachusetts, like all these people run together. So if one president gets fired from such and such university, it's kind of known around the community. So that's the thing I will tell you about higher ed. It is a tight knit community in the sense that all of these people are aware of each other. Right. Uh, but I hope the students really do hold strong. Like I said before, I think they could do a massive walkout. And that can really, you know, make their voices heard even more. What was really interesting, though, was that even Ilhan Omar's daughter was also arrested and suspended. So that's interesting. So apparently having a congressman uh, as your parents doesn't always work out for you in your favor. Let's go to some of the comments uh, here. M or Mr. Natural. Remember Kent State shooting a protesters? Yes, I do. I do remember reading about that. Um, Eliza says NYPD is so disgusting. I agree. Uh, shout out to Natalie for the super chat. When Boeing laid off in the early 2000s, the school districts filled all the sub teacher positions with them. Real teachers like me couldn't get those jobs. Interesting. Uh, Savvy says it's all the rentier economy that Dr. Michael Hudson discusses. I'll have to check that out. Thank you so much. And Skipster says, Eric T ask, I think you mean Savvy to upload her clips to rumble too. Yeah. You know, it, that's interesting because like there used to be a sync. So like all of my clips from YouTube would automatically just sync over to rumble. And then somewhere along the way that just stopped happening. I don't know if that's on rumbles end or if that's on YouTube's end, but yeah, that was really convenient. Like when that was happening. Um, but yeah, that's something I could uh, definitely do. Okay. We are going to move on to our next story here. We have huge surprising news for RFK Jr.'s campaign. Before we get into that, folks, I'm working with this mouse here. I think my mouse pad needs to be replaced. If you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash that like button, folks. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. All right. Huge news about RFK Jr.'s campaign. There's two things that have happened here. We're gonna talk about the Kennedy family first. So for one, uh, I don't remember all of the members of the Kennedy family joining together to make a public endorsement of a presidential candidate. Don't get me wrong here and there. There may have been a couple of them that have made an endorsement, but for the most part, this is the first time I've seen where all of them have seemed to come together and decide to coalesce, you know, along Joe Biden, which is really, really interesting. And they are doing this on purpose. I believe this is being done to put pressure on RFK Jr. to drop out of the campaign. Now, I don't support RFK Jr. for president, but I think 
the gymnastics that is happening around this to push third party and independent candidates to drop out of these races just so Joe Biden can have an easier chance of winning in November, I think is absolutely ridiculous. You know, let people run, let them do what they want to do. And I don't think that RFK Jr. dropping out of this campaign is actually going to help Joe Biden. I, I think if anything, that actually might hurt Joe Biden. Most of the RFK Jr. supporters that I have spoken to said that if RFK Jr. is not in this race, they would actually support Donald Trump. So I don't think this would really help Joe Biden in the way that they think it would. However, here it is. Members of RFK Jr.'s family, <laughs> oh God, this is Carrie Kennedy here speaking. They've all gotten together now to come out and offer their support for Joe Biden publicly. Listen to this. As Donald Trump proudly brags about overturning Roe v. Wade, rolling black, back the clock 50 years to when women couldn't make our own health care decisions, President Biden is fighting to get our freedoms back. Thank you, Joe Biden. She conveniently leaves out that the Democratic Party could have codified Roe v. Wade into law decades ago. Decades ago. The Democratic Party could have tried to do this the very first year when the Democrats had control of the House. You know? This is only part of the very long list of freedoms and rights that President Biden is protecting during a pe period of constant assault. Make mo no mistake, all these rights and freedoms are on the ballot in November. Donald Trump is running to take us backwards, attacking the most basic rights and freedoms that are at the core of who we are as Americans. He said he will be a dictator on day one, even saying he wants to suspend the Constitution so he can go after his enemies, after his critics, after the press. He is running to use his power to punish his enemies, silence his opponents, and incite more chaos, division, and political violence with his extreme agenda. He is the most anti-democratic president in American history. And what they're doing right now is not anti-democratic. Everybody coming together. And by the way, it's not just the Kennedy family members. There's also environmental organizations that are pressuring RK Jr. to drop out of the presidential race. I kid you not. Environmental organizations. I guess they seem to be okay with Joe Biden approving the Willow Project, approving more drilling projects. I have often said this, you know, many times before. Some of these organizations. Some of like, like the sunshine movement, I talked about them before. Some of them also, they're shady. <laughs> they're shady. They say they care about environmental rights, but they're supporting someone who's obviously going against those environmental rights. Ay, ay, ay. President Trump spews dangerous conspiracy theories on climate change, vaccines, windmills, and voter fraud. He is pledging to repeal the Affordable Care Act and cut Social Security and Medicare, ripping away health care and earned benefits for millions of Americans who were lost. Pause. Um, did she make this public speech when Joe Biden threatened to remove Social Security and Medicare for people? When he made that speech on the Senate floor, did she come up and make this kind of speech then? Did she make this kind of speech last year when Joe Biden cut Medicaid? When Joe Biden actually kicked people off of SNAP? Did she make this speech about Joe Biden? I on them in their retirement. I can only imagine how Donald Trump's outrageous lies and behavior would have horrified my father, Senator Robert F. Kennedy who proudly served as the Attorney General of the United States and honored his pledge to uphold the law and protect the country. Uh, RFK probably also would be horrified by the fact that so many politicians are taking money from the Israeli lobby today. Daddy stood for equal justice, for human rights, and freedom from want and fear, just as President Biden does today.
Donald Trump mocks these values just as he mocks our system of laws. He predicted a bloodbath if he loses the election. We cannot afford to ignore his warning. We can say today with no less. That's a misquote. Um, I'm sorry, I do have to debunk that. And again, I don't even support Donald Trump. Hasn't that already been, <laughs> hasn't that been debunked multiple times? That that was a little sound bite that CNN chose to air and leave out the context of that, that discussion where he was talking about the auto workers. He was talking about what it would be like for them if he were to lose. And she's repeating that same talking point. Interesting, huh? Urgency that our rights and freedoms are once again in peril. This is why we all need to come together in a campaign that should unite not, unite not only Democrats, but all Americans, including Republicans and independents who believe in what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. A vote. Here they go, quoting dead presidents. A vote for Joe Biden is a vote for our democracy and our decency. It's hilarious to me how they continue to talk about democracy, but here they are trying to push other people out of the race. That's not democracy. It's not democracy when you tell people that they shouldn't be able to be on the ballot. How is that democracy? Again, I don't even support RFK Jr., but this is ridiculous. This is absolutely, yes, thank you, Oz. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. And it's embarrassing. Really? I, I don't know what they think this is supposed to do. I really don't. And people are like, RFK Jr.'s family doesn't even approve of what he's doing. And you know how many people are still close to their family members? Don't you know when people become adults, especially once you get to like a certain age, you know, a lot of people, once they get into like that 30-ish age range or whatever, not everybody is close to their family members. Not everybody stays close to their family members. Hell, I got friends haven't seen their family in over 10 years. So I, I don't get it. I don't get the comments. I don't get those kind of remarks like his family doesn't approve. He's a grown ass man. And here we go again. You're going to see RFK Jr.'s brother calling him out. Like, this is just so sad. They came and got all these people out the woodwork. You're really, really, really trying. They're really trying. Yeah, I know. We I'm cannot do anything that in any way strips even one vote from President Biden. Mm. And a guy, you put the name Kennedy on the ballot and Democrats are gonna feel torn. And Bruh, it's 2024, son. It is 2024. You know, one thing I noticed about the Kennedy family, they still act like, you know, every time you speak, every time you make an appearance, you ain't got to bring up but the, the Kennedy days and the Democrat days with JFK, RFK. You ain't got to bring them up uh, every time. It, it, uh, it, people have moved on and moved forward. And sometimes a legacy is just a legacy. And you have to learn from that and move forward. Now they want to talk about some of the things that JFK did, but they want to leave other things out. They want to leave out the fact that JFK was against APAC, that JFK actually wanted it to register as a foreign agent. Back then it had a different name, but he wanted it to register as a foreign. They won't mention that though. RFK Jr. does all these interviews and says, my father, this, my uncle, that. But when it comes to how they felt about APAC, the Israeli lobby, how they felt about the state of Israel, that information is left out. But we need to move forward. Now, I get sick of it. I live right here in Massachusetts. I get tired of it. It gets old. Same thing with Joseph Kennedy III when he ran against Ed Markey. He wasn't even running on anything. He was just running on the fact that he was a Kennedy. He was already in the house. He's like, I'm going to try to get Ed Markey's seat and I'm going to win because I'm a Kennedy and all the young people are going to come out and vote for me. Bro, no, you didn't have any platform. It's just, I'm tired of it. And if you lived here in Massachusetts, you would get tired of it too. They didn't like, oh, they're Kennedy. They get this, they get that. So apparently because you're a Kennedy, you're, suppo you're supposed to follow a certain path. We are trying to make them understand that this is an issue that they do not have to feel torn about. That the entire Kennedy family, every single one of us in every family, 
have all supported President Biden. Would I've you, never heard of that before in my family. Would you encourage? So you're a cult. Your brother to drop out? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Of course I, I would. Appreciate your time. Yeah, I know. We so cannot I do anything. And I think he's on. Cr hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Is he on crutches? I think I missed that the first time I saw this video. I think he is on crutch. Let me see. hold up. Hold up. Let's see. One second. Let's go all the way over. What is in his hand? They went up to this guy when he's on crutches. This is how desperate they are. This is how desperate they are. And wait till you hear the other news that I'm going to share with you, because I'm going to show you why they're doing what they're doing. Right? So here's the RFK Jr. Surprise folks. Wait for it. RFK Jr. Secures ballot access in battleground state of Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a game changer because prior to this, he was on the ballot in Utah. I told you that he qualified in reference to signatures in Arizona, but I don't think he has the ballot access just yet. I don't know what the holdup is with that, but you know how these things go. But now he has actually secured ballot access in a swing state and not just any swing state, Michigan. Remember what I told you? Joe Biden has to win Michigan in order to win. So now everybody coming out, they didn't win and got the whole damn Kennedy clan. Like they, they got everybody, all of them, Tom, Dick, Harry, John, Rob, everybody come get together and make it public and let everybody know that the Kennedy family supports Joe Biden for reelection. And we do not support what RFK Jr. is doing. This is just ridiculous. It just, I, I, I don't know, but this is huge. And we're going to get into this because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot to be said. Independent presidential candidate RFK Jr. has secured a place on the ballot in the battleground state of Michigan. Kennedy's independent bid has spooked allies of both President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, the presumptive Democratic and Republican nominees who fear his last name and dedicated support among a slice of disaffected voters will be enough to tip the election. So let's go ahead and bring up this. And thank you so much for saying this, Roger. Someone tell RFK's brother, the electoral college vote selects the president. So all of this peeling votes away is BS. And the electoral college vote is supposed to go by uh, the popular vote. But very good point there, because I think what Roger is saying is that third party and independent candidates haven't won electoral college votes, right? But so they're they're basically saying that RFK Jr. being in this race alone is going to hurt. Basically, they're, they're saying Joe Biden. Right. But then that pressure should be put on Joe Biden for him to be a better president. Joe Biden would be in this situation if he hadn't reneged on some of his campaign promises. He wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't for the, the way that he's reacting in reference to Israel and Gaza if it wasn't for inflation, which is back again, increasing again, by the way, if it wasn't for this war in Ukraine, if it wasn't for a lot of these things that Joe Biden has had happen under his presidency, continuing some of Donald Trump's tax cuts. These are things that he is responsible for. You know, you can, the first year the president is, or their first year that they're in office, I think it's fair to kind of point to and say, well, this was left over from the previous administration, but there are things that you can do by executive order. And she talked about health care. Uh, I don't see Joe Biden fixing things with health care either. Really? Like people are like, well, the prescription drugs, eh, that's nothing. That's nothing. If you really wanted to make health care better in this country, you'd make sure that everyone had health care in this country and you would approve some type of universal health care plan or Medicare for all plan so that everyone is covered the little crumbs that Joe Biden is doing, we're just going to deduct some of these prescription drugs. And then it's for certain people. Uh, those are crumbs and you deserve more as a taxpayer and as an American period. So he wouldn't even be in this situation 
if he was doing the things that the American people actually want. Biden scooped up endorsements from at least 15 members of the Kennedy political family during a campaign stop Thursday in Philadelphia. A spokesperson for the Michigan Secretary of the state's office said the Natural Law Party, a minor party with a line on the state's ballot, nominated Kennedy at the convention. Now, this is going to be interesting considering the fact that Michigan, they actually started the uncommitted votes campaign, right? Remember they had all those people come out and voted in the primary and they voted uncommitted. You know, I think a lot of those people are still not going to vote for Joe Biden uh, in November, especially those that are part of the Muslim community. But I also don't think they're going to vote for RFK Jr. either once they start to hear his rhetoric in reference to Israel and Gaza. So this will be interesting. Kennedy faces an expensive and time consuming process to get on the ballot in all 50 states and the District of Columbia without the backing of a political party. Michigan is the second state. <clears throat> excuse me. Michigan is the second state after Utah to affirm that his name will be presented to voters. His campaign or an allied super PAC say they've collected enough signatures in several other states, including battlegrounds of Arizona, <clears throat> Georgia, Nevada, and North Carolina, but they haven't yet been validated by election officials. So that's what ha what's happening there. However, I did see a poll with Trump, Biden, and RFK for Arizona, and that poll actually had a three-way tie. Now, that was a couple weeks ago. I will have to check that information again. But Arizona, I told you, I wouldn't be surprised if Biden didn't win Arizona this time around, uh, mainly because of the immigration issue, mainly because of the border issue. I will see that going to towards Donald Trump, to be honest. I don't think he's going to win Georgia again. I could also see that going towards uh, Donald Trump. People in Atlanta are not too happy with him. And I told you guys to question Nevada. I don't, Nevada isn't guaranteed to remain blue. It's not even a dark blue. It's a light blue. So Trump could even pick up a state like Nevada again because of the issue at the border. We, uh, North Carolina, I think is going to remain red. But let me tell you what I think is really happening here. And then we'll get into this clip from News Nation uh, about uh, Kennedy's new ballot access. I want you to hear how they talk about this. It's really interesting. Here's what I think is happening, folks. I sincerely, I have this gut-wrenching feeling and it's the same kind of feeling that I used to have when I felt like I was getting a little nauseous when I was a kid. I really believe that they are trying to pressure RFK Jr. to drop out of this campaign, not just by using the Kennedy family to do so, not just by getting environmental organizations to also ask him to drop out. That's a doozy. I, I think some of these people are paid. I wouldn't be surprised if some of these people are paid off. There's that. There will be others that they bring forward. You have to remember the petition that Rokana filed to convince his running mate, Nicole Shanahan, to drop out and to work with the Democratic Party. She put him on blast for that. Rightfully so. But something tells me, and if I'm wrong, I'll come back and eat my words. Something tells me that RFK Jr. is going to drop out. And I don't think it's something that'll happen like this month or next month, but something tells me they're going to put enough pressure his way that he may drop out. Now, what's going to happen after he drops, if he does drop out? Let's get into this clip from News Nation first, and then I'm going to tell you my prediction because I really do think Getting RFK Jr. to drop out, I think that's actually going to backfire against the Biden administration. Let's get into this clip By here. By the way, <laughs> President Biden wrapped up his three-day swing in Pennsylvania with an endorsement from one of the most prominent families in all of Democratic politics. We want to make crystal clear our feeling that the best way forward for America is to reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to four more years. I don't want to become emotional, but what an incredible honor to have the support of the Kennedy family. Not in attendance, of course, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., <laughs> who himself is running as an independent in November. Now, while he didn't get his siblings endorsement and, and that got 
all the headlines today, I want to say not all, but maybe most, right? The family comes out for Biden. It's, it's not a good look. Nobody wants to see that, right? But I thought there might have been a bigger story, and tell me if I'm wrong, that it, RFK Jr. got ballot access in the state of Michigan. And if Joe Biden wants to win re-election, you both are saying yes, he's got to win the state of Michigan. So what is it? And that's part of the reason why they probably came out publicly like they did. This is what I'm trying to tell you guys. They know there was a chance that he was going to get ballot access in some of these swing states. Mean that now RFK Jr. is mixing it up in maybe the most important state in the election. I mean, I think the Democrats have always seen him as the biggest threat to Biden's reelection promises or hopes. And so, of course, they're going to be upset that he's in Michigan. I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise. They've been hanging out with the Bidens very cozy. It's St. Patrick's Day pictures, vacationing together. I mean, the Kennedys are yeah, all was... about making sure they distance themselves and coming out vocally. So, of course, there's no headlines on. I'm not surprised at all. What I do think is so interesting is how RFK Jr. responded is precisely why the juxtaposition between how he responded and how Biden's all of that response would have been is precisely why Americans are so tired of the discourse, except for Max. Everyone hates how divisive everything is right now. So he responds the, with kindness. Yeah, we could put the, the statement up Stability. on the screen. He wasn't yeah. hostile to his family no. at all. He sort took of, the high road. He, he did took the Michelle the Obama. To put it. OK, so yeah. obvious. What um, what concerns you more that? Let me read his statement. I hear some of my family will be endorsing President Biden today. Uh, I am pleased they are politically active. It's a family tradition. We are <laughs> we are divided in our opinions, but united in our love for each other. <laughs> oh man, let me talk about let's talk about united for our love for each other because when I talk about united for our love for each other, if his family did not agree with him running for a president and they do support Joe Biden, best thing they could have done was sit back and be quiet. Best thing they could have done was just sit and chill, not make any public statements and just stay to themselves. That's the best thing they could have done for someone that they love and care so much about. Not this public embarrassment that they did, the speech that they did. We're going to support Joe Biden. I'm just like, get out of here, man. Get out of here. And, it, you know, they talk about RFK and JFK. Would RFK and, JOK and JFK be okay with someone like Joe Biden if they were alive today? They were to the left of Joe Biden. You think they would be okay with Joe Biden and his history as a politician in this country? You think they would approve of Joe Biden taking all that money from the Israeli lobby? You think they'd be fine with that? Do you think that they would approve of the way that Joe Biden is handling Israel's assault on Gaza? I don't think they would be okay with that. They could have just stayed quiet. As Democrats, that he, that Biden, well, let me ask, let, let, me, let me put it this way. Michigan, RFK Jr. on the ballot. Is that the real story today? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, right now in the polling, we're seeing that Kennedy specifically is polling somewhat equally from both the Trump camp and the Biden camp. But what we're also seeing is that in an absence of any third party candidate, Joe Biden is doing better than Donald Trump would under the same circumstances. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see negative messaging towards RFK. Um, oh, that's happening already. Yeah. No, no, I mean like real money behind okay. it. Um, on you heard what he just said? He let the game get away, right? He said, no, 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 no. I mean real money behind it because they've had negative messages about RFK from the day that he announced his campaign when he was still running the Democratic Party, right? But now he's like, no, 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 with real money behind it. So there he is giving the game away, letting you know it's all backed by money, big money. TV, we're not seeing anything on TV in these swing states yet. Um, and they'll do and they should do whatever's necessary to, to win this thing. RFK Jr. on the ballot in Michigan. Well, I agree here. I think that, you know, the Biden camp can't lose sight of RFK as someone who is pulling support steadily. Um, and it could be a challenge for Democrats, especially when you think about a state like Michigan with really narrow margin of victory. Um, Democrats have to make sure that they're continuing to solidify their base, but also keeping keeping their eye on RFK and his supporters. And if they need to continue to kind of galvanize that support and bring them back home, so be it. I think that's got to be a part of their strategy. Give you the last what do you mean bring them back home? See, this is an assumption that these people, the people that are supporting RFK Jr. were Democrats. 
Some of these people are registered independents. Some of these people are just tired of the two-party system. Some of these people, you know, some of the people that are supporting RFK Jr. told me they actually haven't voted since Barack Obama, since 08. But now they're thinking about, you know, getting back in, they'll vote for him, but they don't want to vote for the two-party system. She says, bring them back home. Listen, when you leave the home, you leave for a reason. You know, how many of you, when you left like your parents' home, you were like, look, I'm an adult now. I'm doing my own thing. No going back. When you leave the home, you leave for a reason. And she's trying to bring, she said, come, <laughs> come back home. If they wanted to be there, they would be there. What a mess. Right here, Mick. Uh, Michigan's a big story. It is. Uh, but Max is right. The question is not what uh, not what Kennedy is pulling. It, it doesn't make a difference if he's pulling 2% or 22%. It makes a difference who he's pulling mm -hmm. from. If he's pulling 2% and it's all from Joe Biden, that's a real problem. For right. Him. Okay. All right. Thank you for watching. Okay. So let me tell you what I think is, is happening here. Yeah. Terry said all political theater. Yeah. Let, let me explain something here. I have this feeling RFK Jr. is going to drop out. Someone mark this. Today is April 19th. I have this feeling RFK Jr. is going to end up dropping out because this is just the beginning of some of the pressure from the outside, the environmental organizations, uh, the family, which we knew the family was going to, you know, they, they were against this from day one. Even when he was running as a Democrat, they were still against it. Right. So we knew that was coming. But I believe there are going to be more organizations and more, you know, people that publicly come forward uh, to shame him, uh, try to embarrass him. Uh, we're going to hear all kinds of things that are going to come out, things that we probably have never heard of before, uh, to convince him to drop out. And I was convinced of that the moment that I saw that petition from Rokana asking his uh, running mate to leave RFK Jr.'s campaign and to come back, come back home, <laughs> as she said, to the Democratic Party. And I really believe this. And he may not be the only one. And I, I just, I, you know, it is a hot mess. Whether you support his campaign or not, I don't support his campaign, but I just think it's ridiculous what this country is doing. It's ridiculous what our government is doing and not letting people just run, you know, in these elections freely you got to come out and, and smear them and and say that they shouldn't do this and you know none of this would have happened if they actually would have let the people who were running the democratic party actually have a real debate and a real campaign that's why he left the democratic party and started to run as an independent but the reality is folks they are still very scared because he's polling double digits in some of the swing states and i don't care what the national poll tells you about Donald Trump and Joe Biden right now. At the end of the day, this comes down to those swing states. It comes down to Nevada, Michigan, Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia. Did I miss one? It comes down to the swing states. So when you look at these polls and it says, oh, well, Joe Biden's at 47% and Donald Trump's here or Donald Trump's leading about none of that matters. What matters are the swing states. So you have to look at how those candidates are polling in those swing states, and that can make a big determination. Now, that being said, I told you, most of the RFK Jr. supporters that I've spoken to said that if RFK Jr. is not in this race come November, they will support Donald Trump. Some may stay home. It's just very, very, very telling. Did I forget Arizona? I forgot Arizona Fiat, Arizona. But I know we know who's not going to drop out. And that's right, live the dream. Jill won't drop out. Right. She's done this before. When have you known the Green Party candidate to drop out of the presidential race? So I, I don't know, guys. I don't know, but it is something. So he's on the ballot in Michigan, and they are very afraid. Let's go to some of these comments. So lots of starred comments from Eric. Thank you for the super chat, R. Bailey. This unity is not about helping Biden, but about the continuation of pocket padding for those who benefit from his candidacy. Good point. Thank you, Troy. RFK Jr. singing, they smile in your face all the time. They want to take your place. Backstabbers, backstabbers. That's right, Troy. I know that song. Thank you, Carrie. And rich homeless should be the focus. No hocus pocus. Thank you, Cool Blue. 
If it weren't for the candidacy of RFK Jr., the Kennedys would be totally irre irrelevant. <laughs> Who has that family on one's mind? Yeah. I mean, like, unless you live here in Massachusetts, you kind of, you're not thinking, you kind of forget about them. It's just reality. Uh, Miguel says the entire Kennedy family needs to retire from politics permanently. That's a good point. Thank you, Janine. Random, I love the shirt. Oh, thank you. I wasn't sure about it, you know? It's got like pearls on it. So I wasn't, they're not real pearls, but I wasn't sure about it. But it's it's purple, it's different. Thank you, Courtney. It could be me, but what I've noticed is the majority of anyone who publicly endorses Joe Biden barely or fail to mention any of Joe's policies, that's actually good. Mm, I don't think it's just you, Courtney. I don't think it's just you. Thank you, Asan. The people of the Middle East love the people of the United States. We have the same dreams as Americans and those robbing you are robbing us too. Hashtag free Palestine. Well said, Asan. Uh, thank you, Cool Blue. If one wants to cite just one state, which will tell us who will win the 2024 U.S. presidential election, that state is Michigan. There you go. I'm telling you. Uh, Charlotte says the whole Kennedy family is paid off. Nicole Shanahan has got to go. We don't need a Google big shot in the White House. Interesting. The Oracle says the Kennedys are believing their own press. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, thank you for the super chat, Cool Blue. 2024 Ds know they slash Biden will lose. They want RFK Jr. in. After they lose, they will attribute their well-earned loss to third party candidacy of RFK Jr. Yeah, because you know, this happened with uh George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Because George H. W. Bush was running for re-election and Ross Perot was, I think he ran as independent. Yeah, independent candidate. Ross Perot also was polling pretty well for an independent candidate. Until this day, you know, they still say that Ross Perot was the reason why. Uh, Bush did not win re-election and Bill Clinton did. Amos Ross Perot. He had an interesting voice. <laughs> interesting voice. Another billionaire. Anyway, folks, go ahead and smash that like button. If you're new, don't forget to like, love, and share. And let's get into probably the most heated story since last night. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Israel has decided to strike back at Iran. So in another way, it's kind of like if we were watching Star Wars, I do kind of feel like Israel is the empire. Right? And I feel like, you know, Iran or, you know, also Gaza is return of the jet. They're the Jedi. You know, it's kind of how I look at it. If you haven't seen Star Wars, my apologies. But the empire was like the evil empire, Darth Vader and all that jazz. And that kind of reminds me of Israel. So they did strike back. Now, before we get into what happened last night, I want to show you what happened one hour before Israel decided to strike Iran. There was actually this interview on CNN with Aaron. Thank you so much for this squid diddly. CNN, exactly one hour before Israel attack on Iran. Did they know? And Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdullahian and Mr. Foreign Minister, thank you so much. Uh, Israel has vowed to retaliate against the Iranian strike over the weekend. Do you think Israel could strike as soon as tonight? And Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdullahian and Mr. Foreign Minister, thank you so much. Uh, Israel has vowed to retaliate against the Iranian strike over the weekend. Do you think Israel could strike as soon as tonight? So that apparently was one hour before Israel decided to attack I Iran. Um, now, it's, it appears they attacked nuclear sites. We're going to get into all of that. I think the first video that we saw or I saw was the one from MSNBC. Let's go ahead and get into this here. Again, you have to remember, how did we get here? Let's always ask ourselves that question. How did we get here? Israel, again, has been the aggressor. They decided to attack the Iranian embassy in Damascus. And Iran said that they would retaliate, that they would strike back. They did so. And Joe Biden 
Joe Biden actually uh, made an announcement saying don't do it to Israel, not to strike back at uh, Iran. But BB basically said they're going to do what they want to do. And they did. Let's get into it. We are monitoring breaking news in Iran. For more, we're going to be joined now by NBC News, Pentagon and national security correspondent Courtney Kuby. Courtney, what do we have? So, Lawrence, there has been some breaking news all this evening that we've been trying to get more detail on. Here's what we know so far. According to Iran's semi-official state media, that's FARS, they are saying that there have been a series of explosions in Iran, in a city called Isfahan. Now, why a lot of our viewers may have heard of that city is because it's where some of Iran's critical nuclear infrastructure exists. But so far, it seems that these explosions are not specifically in Isfahan, where the nuclear facility is, but are nearby. Now, the U.S. U.S. officials are not saying anything about this. Neither are Israeli officials. But of course, this all comes when there has been this back and forth between Iran and Israel and threats for both from both sides. Now, of course, on April 1st, the Israeli military struck a site in Damascus, which was later determined to be some sort of a consular site killing a number of senior Iranian officials, including a general, a senior general in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. And they expected Iran not to respond after that. Right. So if we look at the situation in Gaza, we look at the situation in the West, the West Bank, we look at, because Israel's not just attacking Iran, they're also attacking Lebanon and Syria. We look at the situation of all these countries, who has been the aggressor? It has been Israel. Israel likes to throw stones and hide their hand. Like if we were on the playground and we were kids, Israel is the kid that walks up to another kid and punches them in the face and then they run away and don't let you hit them back. But then the next day, when you come back to the playground, after you've been punched in the face, you decide you're going to punch Israel back in the face. So you go back up to the other kid and you punch the other kid back in the face. And then Israel is the kid that runs to the teacher and cries and says, they're attacking me. Totally leaves out that they were the one that hit first. That's Israel on the playground. Now, if you think about this and we're looking at what's happening here, this location here is Fran. So this isn't that far from Tehran, right? Not that far from it. And this is kind of like Israel's way, I think, of sending a message. You know what I mean? Let me take this, uh, these captions off. This is kind of their way of sending a message. Now, I want you to look at this map. Look at how large Iran is and look at the size of Israel. Okay. Do you think it is wise and continue considering the type of weapons that Iran has? Do you think it is wise for Israel to, to attack Iran? Do you think it's wise? Cause I don't think it's wise. I feel like Israel is trying to drag us into world war three. And I mean, drag us, all of us, because if this continues to escalate, they're not going to fight this conflict alone. The next thing you know, which Biden has already hinted towards, the next thing you know, they're going to be trying to send U.S. troops to go fight this war as well. And my message to all of you that are in the military, if you're eligible to leave, now would be the time to exit. All of you who were thinking about joining the military, now would be the time to change your mind. Because the last thing that you want to be involved in is another conflict in the Middle East. This is serious. Iran is not like some little rinky dink country that doesn't have, you know, advanced weapons. They have advanced weapons and you should be concerned about the fact that this could escalate in any way, shape or form. We all, of course, we know, Lawrence, that last weekend, Iran retaliated with pretty great force, about 300 projectiles, missiles and drones, most of which were shot down. But Israel again vowed to respond. Now, among the possible response options that we have been hearing about this week that Israel briefed the U.S. on ahead of the strikes last weekend was the possibility of some sort of a response inside Iran, but also the possibility of strikes against proxy forces and, and against Iranian uh, facilities outside of Iran. 
There are also some reports tonight of explosions in Syria and in Iraq. But I really have to stress at this point, we do not have any confirmation who was behind any of these explosions, these possible strikes, other than to say everyone has really been waiting on edge to see if Israel would respond to this massive volley of strikes that they took against Israel, that Iran took against Israel on Saturday, Lawrence. Now I want to add this part too. They attacked Iraq. Why? They're dragging Iraq. This is what I'm saying. They're not just attacking one. They, they're going after Gaza. They're assaulting people in the West Bank. They've been bombing Lebanon and Syria. Now Iraq, as well as Iran, they're really trying to have a full-scale World War III. And I say World War III because who do you think the other countries are going to back? Think about this for a second. Do you think Russia is going to back Iran or Israel? My bet is on Iran. And if China were to get involved, who do you think China is going to back? You think China is going to also back Israel? So the European countries and the United States would be backing Israel. But do you really want to have any type of war with Russia and China and Iran? Can't forget about BRICS. And Courtney, uh, this is ahead of where our information is now, but a few days from now or whatever amount of time it takes, when would we have or could we have an accurate assessment, damage assessment of what might have actually occurred tonight? So we're already seeing, frankly, some social media video of explosions over the skies in Isfahan. There's some things that are starting to come out from both Iraq and Syria. So we may get a better sense of that in the next day or so. It's, it's about Yes, you can said the reports on them attacking Iraq were false savvy. OK, yeah, MSNBC, you need to fix this because <laughs> I was like, why would you go after Iraq? Out daylight in, in, in all three locations right now, uh, Friday morning. So we may get a sense of that. The real question, though, is will we get any attribution to this? Now, keep in mind, there are there's a widespread knowledge that Israel ta has taken a number of strikes inside Syria in recent years, specifically going usually going after Lebanese Hezbollah, going after shipments of component parts, advanced missile parts uh, that, that Iran ships to Hezbollah in Syria. And they very rarely, if ever, acknowledge any of those strikes. It would not be it, it, it would not surprise me if we don't have any statement of attribution for who is behind these, except for the fact that Israel has been vowing to respond here. So, again, I have to say we still don't know what who or what caused these explosions in these three locations. We've been working on this feverishly for a matter of hours now, Lawrence, and we'll continue. But at this point, again, the U.S. and the Israelis are not saying anything. And, and even Iran, while acknowledging there have been explosions, is not saying who or what was behind them. Courtney. But we all have common sense and we all knew, right? So this is when it was first reported uh, last night. I do have update, updated information for today as and well. Judy, Pentagon correspondent, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. We're going to come back to you as, you as this story develops. And joining us now is Ben Rhodes, who served as Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama. He's an MSNBC political analyst. Ben, uh, will on the issue of attribution, uh, will the United States issue a statement of uh, having nothing to do with it, possibly. Yeah, that's quite possible. And uh, in, in fact, Lawrence, in the past, even when Israel has taken strikes against Iranian targets in third countries, in places like Lebanon and Syria, um, sometimes the United States does put out a statement to clarify that it itself was not involved. Um, that said, I mean, it's not a mystery, you know, um, if you have this kind of uh, attack, particularly if it's in Isfahan uh, and if it's against Iranian proxies in places like Iraq and Syria, um, I, I don't think there's going to be a ton of mystery around it. Uh, I think what we can say with assurance is that the United States itself did not participate in, in that kind of military activity. What do you? Let's pause here for a second because they always try to wash the hands of the United States uh, government, right? Who is giving Israel the weapons? That is coming from the United States. I think Germany is second, but we are supplying most of the weapons to Israel. If the U S government stopped giving that aid to Israel, would Israel be able to have all these attacks? 
So we can't just sit here and pretend like the United States government doesn't have any involvement whatsoever. Of course, they would get the Obama official, of course. What do you expect uh, in, in terms of the unfolding of this information at this hour? When might we hear something from uh, more, more clear uh, for, or something official from the Pentagon? Well, I think that, you know, it's likely that assuming Israel carried out these strikes, um, they would notify the United States probably shortly beforehand. Uh, if they did carry out strikes inside of Iran at a place like Isfahan, um, that obviously would go against what Joe Biden had counseled them, which is to not uh, directly retaliate against Iranian territory. Um, I think the U.S. has a greater degree of tolerance and understanding of uh, Israeli strikes against Iranian proxies across the region. But even in the event in which the Israeli government knows that the Biden administration might not support their action, they would still notify the United States. I think that it's um, do we honestly believe that, ladies and gentlemen, that they would absolutely do that? Considering the fact that Netanyahu has basically said over and over again when it comes to this conflict, he doesn't care what the United States government says. He's going to do what he wants to do. So do we really believe that they would play by the rules? They haven't been playing by the rules all this time. Committing war crimes, killing children. And we believe that they would play by the rules. A little bit more here and then we'll go to the necessary, next. Necessary, though, to wait and see whether this is the conclusion of uh, a military action. Is this a series of kind of one-off strikes in Iraq and Syria and Iran, uh, or is it the beginning of several strikes that could take place in different places? Um, I, I think the U.S., before it comments in any formal way, would obviously want to know and be certain um, that this latest round of escalation has concluded. Um, so, you know, I'd expect that uh, to happen kind of over our night. Um, but again, I think the U.S. will also take some lead from whether or not Israel is publicly commenting, publicly uh, taking responsibility uh, for these strikes. I, I, you know, given how much Israel said that it was going to respond, um, even though they've it's sometimes been reluctant to claim responsibility for certain military actions, given how far they've been out there saying they're going to respond, you know, I, I have to assume we get some confirmation from the Israeli side, too, um, in the coming hours. Um okay. That was last night. Let's move on a little bit here because I do want to move forward because, of course, you know, the White House press secretary was questioned about this, this action. Now, Asal Rod, uh, she's actually been on RBN a couple of times. She actually shared this. I want you to hear how uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre, the press secretary for Joe Biden, I want you to hear how she responds to these attacks. In the Middle East... Why is it that you don't have any comment at this time? It's been several hours since the reported strike. Uh, certainly that's enough time for the administration to investigate and come up with something to say. I'm just going to be really mindful, uh, just going back to what I said just, just before I um, called on you to ask me this question. So I'm not going to speak or speculate about any of the reports that are out there. I'm not going to comment and I'm just going to leave it there your strategy to de-escalate? Look, I'm going to, again, be super mindful. And I, I get the interest, obviously. I understand the interest. And uh, and going to be disappointing many people here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I just don't have anything to share. I'm not going to speculate on the reportings out there. You heard uh, the same. Obviously, you said uh, our, our, what we've been saying. going to be mindful because... Let me pause for a second. So this was actually this afternoon not last night. And she has obviously been ordered not to respond about the attack on Iran. Why are you there? Why are you a part of this press conference? You know, what is the point of the press secretary? <laughs> where you're just like, I don't want to respond. I don't want to, I don't want to make any assumptions or anything like that. Like why, why are you holding this press conference? Because not going to speak or speculate to uh, any of the events from last night. And I know, I know you all have a lot of questions on this. I get it. I understand. I just, I want to be mindful here. Going to be mindful here. I, uh, we're not, I'm not going to speculate or speak on uh, any of the events that's been reported. Special response. Uh, and given that yeah. U.S. taxpayers give more than $3 billion each year for military defense systems to Israel, 
shouldn't Americans have a response from this administration more than 12 hours after this attack? I appreciate the question and I understand the importance of the American people who you are correct, they are taxpayers. And I want to be incredibly mindful here and I understand the interest here uh, and I am going to continue to say I'm not going to speak to this or speculate uh, about the reports out there. That's not going to change and i um, just going to be super mindful. I think she's in the wrong gig. I think maybe she should have been a counselor or something like that, you know, with <laughs> maybe she should have been a counselor the way that she speaks. I'm going to be very mindful here. Oh, so you just told me that you just punched your friend in the face and that you want to drag him. I'm going to be very mindful here. I don't want to speculate anything. And um, that's all I can really say at this point. Maybe she should have been a counselor instead. It is the next day after this attack, the next day, you don't know anything. You don't want, even if you did know something, you were told not to say anything. She's another, she's a puppet. She's another puppet. So she's been told not to say anything. Why? Probably because it was already ordered that Israel was not supposed to respond. That was the demand. Do not respond. You're even, let it go, don't respond. And Israel decided to respond anyway. They're not listening to what the U.S. government is saying. And yet here we got our Congress members arguing about whether or not to give aid to Israel. Why would you continue giving aid and weapons to a country that's not even listening to you during the time of war? So why would you continue to give them, get out of here? So the interesting part about all this is that when you look at it, when you look at Corinne Jean-Pierre, you know, she probably knows more, but she was told not to say anything. What good are these positions, right? These people are just puppets. That's kind of how I look at it. But it's, it's interesting. And that's why they don't want to say anything because it shows that Israel defied the order from the president. And no one should be surprised because they're not listening to anybody. This is what happens when you allow a country not to have any accountability for years while they've been slaughtering, imprisoning Palestinian people, occupying Palestinian people. This is what happens when there's no accountability, when they've been bombing Syria and Lebanon and there's no accountability there. This is what happens. Israel is out of control. And now all of a sudden the president expects Israel to listen they haven't been listening all this time. It's embarrassing. Has the president been briefed on these reported events that you don't wish to speculate on? So <laughs> I knew I knew some humor would be coming in, uh, and I appreciate the humor. Speculate on those events or any of the reports that are out there, and I know that is not satisfying to all of you, but that is where we are. Puppet. Notice too how they always put, like most of the time, and you'll see this as well, the next one, most of the time they bring forward, it's it's usually a black face to deliver this news. Just like the woman who raises her hand at the UN Security Council to veto everything in the United States name. Notice these things. Now, I wanna show you this clip in reference to this. It was on Pierce Morgan. Now, this gentleman here, he was on Pierce Morgan and I want you to listen to the first couple minutes of this, some of the things that he debunks about Iran, because Pierce Morgan, and I think honestly, a lot of Americans just don't fully understand how a lot of the countries in the Middle East operate. They see them as a monolith. They're not a monolith, right? And they also have tend to have negative views about some of those Middle Eastern uh, countries, including Pierce Morgan. So listen to this, because I think Pierce Morgan got schooled here. You know quite well, I know quite well, your viewers, your viewers know quite well that the Israeli regime is carrying out genocide. And this stems from a, an ethno-supremacist ideology. It stems from apartheid, and uh, this is unacceptable. And the people who lived on that land, they have been expelled. The people in Gaza, they live in a concentration camp, now a death camp. And uh, the West has brought about this, situ this situation whatever crimes that they've committed against 
Jews and gypsies and Slavs, they have to pay for it themselves. They can't take it out on the Palestinian people. So the Iranians, along with almost everyone else in the world, except for people, some people in your part of the world, believe that the apartheid regime has to come to an end. And uh, by coming to an end, it means that all people of that land have to be able to live as equal human beings. I know that sounds very crazy, but uh, um, ethno-supremacism isn't a good thing. But the position of the Iranian regime is that Israel shouldn't exist, right? Well, the position of the British regime is that Israel, as an apartheid state, should continue to exist. The position of the American regime is well, that on, no, Israel... No, if you could, look, that wasn't the question I asked you, but is the position of I'm answering. Iran's regime... I'm answering. That is, I'm, what, yeah, but what what is the answer to that question? I, I'm getting there. The position of the American regime is that apartheid should continue. Iran's position on South Africa had the same gap. There was the same gap back then when the British and the Americans supported apartheid in South Africa and racial supremacism in the South African regions, Zimbabwe today and so on. Back then, Iran was supporting the indigenous population. Back then, Iran supported the ANC. Back then, Iran supported the military wing of the ANC and Nelson okay, Mandela. But we're not talking about South Africa. I'm talking about what is... So the point that he's trying to make, uh, I think this is Professor Mirandi, the point that he's trying to make is they want the apartheid regime to end. They want the apartheid, the apartheid has to go, right? Well, how is that so difficult to understand? And people like Pierce Morgan and other uh, MSNBC and, and Fox News and CNN pundits, they will take that out of context and they will say that Israel, you know, people want, they want all the Jewish people to die in Israel. That is not what they are saying at all. They want the apartheid to end. Uh, let's be real and let's be clear here, guys. This country hasn't always been the best about being on target with certain issues at the time it should have been. There have been multiple times that our government basically was a little bit too late. Look how long it took the U.S. government to actually acknowledge the Armenian genocide. Look how long it took the U.S. government under Bill Clinton's presidency to admit that what was happening in Rwanda was actually a genocide. We haven't always been the best and timely when it comes to calling out these issues. The Iran's regime's current position in relation to Israel. The Iranians believe that Israel does not have moral legitimacy as an apartheid regime. And the only way that it can gain legitimacy is that if apartheid is cast aside, if ethno supremacism is cast aside, if racial and religious discrimination in the sense that uh, Muslims and Christians are lesser human beings and they don't have any right to the land that they've been on for hundreds of years, that should be set aside. People who have been expelled have the right of return. It's not very uh, complicated. It's not, as you say, rocket science. Well, it may not be complicated to you, but what looks complicated to us uh, is that uh, what Iran has been doing in the last few years, if not decades, has been supporting via proxy uh, groups like the Houthis in Yemen, Hamas in, uh, in Gaza, um, Hezbollah in Lebanon, funding and helping to train them to commit acts of war against Israel firing endless rockets, and as we saw on October the 7th, committing an act of heinous terrorism. Um, so it's not quite as, as simple as you're trying to picture this, is it? Iran has had a vested interest in supporting terror against Israel for a very long time. No, I think uh, the regimes that have a vested interest in supporting terrorism are the ones who are giving the Israeli regime the weapons to carry out genocide. And uh, the genocide began long before October the 7th. And the Gaza Strip was a uh, concentration camp long before October the 7th. You know as well as I that October the 7th didn't occur in a vacuum. And the terrorism has been carried out regularly by the Israeli regime on the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip for, for decades. It regularly bombed them and killed them. And it's not just the Gaza Strip. I think roughly 400 Palestinians have been murdered in the West Bank over the past six months. These, these are regular occurrences, but it doesn't register in the West because, again, the Israelis are Europe. They are European. It's a European colony. They have priorities over the brown people of the land. But the, it is a fact that Palestinian children 
according to the statements made by senior Israeli officials, Palestinian wem women, according to members of the Knesset, they are lesser people. They, if you look at the South African complaint, uh, they, they clearly point out the views of these people and the starvation siege and the intention to starve the people of Gaza, women and children. That is because they look at them as inferior people. This is not about two uh, armies. This is about a subjugated people trying to stand up for their rights. If it was, if you were in Germany- but How would you, let me ask you, Professor. We'll, we'll stop it there for just a second. I guess he told him, right? Notice he called out the European part in reference to Israel. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that is very important. And no, it's not complicated. And I hate when people say that, oh, well, it's very complicated. No, it's not complicated. It's not complex. I understand it. I think a lot of you understand it, right? They say it's complicated because they don't want you to understand and they don't want people to actually admit that Israel is an apartheid state. They don't want people to actually see that Israel is committing genocide, that they are oppressing the Palestinian people. And they've been doing that for years. They don't want people to see that Israel wants to have ethnic cleansing. So instead of telling you the truth, they tell you it's, it's complicated. Shout out to Professor Morandi there. Now, what's going to happen from here, folks? Now, Al Jazeera is calling this out. Israeli attack on nuclear sites to prompt tit for tat pursuing nukes, Iran. And this is what I was afraid of, right? Again, I told you Iran has powerful weapons and capability. Iran warns Israel that if it goes ahead with a retaliation for last week's attack, Tehran will respond in kind and also pursue a nuclear weapon. Listen to this. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has warned that it would attack Israel's nuclear sites and may pursue a nuclear weapon if the country strikes Iran's nuclear facilities. And this is what I mean when I say heading into World War III. This is not a game. This is not something that you can play around with. And Israel, they've been pushing people around for a long time, man. Israel has been that big, chubby bully that, you know, won't leave anybody alone. They pick on everybody around them. And you know what happens with bullies? You know what happens if you don't fight back? They'll just continue to do it. No one has put Israel in their place. And that's part of the problem. And not just the United States, but the other Western allies as well. It took South Africa to stand up and bring Israel to the ICJ so that the entire world can see what Israel was doing. South Africa isn't foolish. They know the ICJ isn't going to enforce anything. But they did this to show the world what Israel is really about. We can go to the second part of type VNC, Eric, when you're ready. I would assume that Iran is not playing around here. And it would not surprise me if they did also issue some type of another retaliatory response to Israel. And this time, I don't think it'll be like it was the first time. This time, I think that they would go a lot harder. And honestly, if I was Israel, I wouldn't want to mess with Iran right now. And again, if you're watching and you're in the military, you have the opportunity to get out. Now would be the time to leave. If you are a parent and you have kids that are thinking about joining the military, now would be the time to tell them that is not a good idea. Don't let your kids go off to fight these wars, killing brown people abroad for a country that doesn't even fight for them. 
Let's take that comment on uh, Rumble, Eric. Uh, thank you, Goo, for the Rumble rant. Would like to see the mask off and see who the Arab government support if, unfortunately, if there is World War III. Yeah, that would be a very revealing moment, wouldn't it? Very revealing. Let's go to the comments here. Uh, Crowen says they are the resistance. Oh, she was talking about um, like Gaza. Yeah. Star Wars rhetoric there. Uh, thank you, Sparky, for the super chat. Great work, Sabby. Love. Keep on trucking. Thank you. Dr. Nick says Hezbollah equals the Ewoks. Oh, <laughs> the Ewoks. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> uh, yes, you can, says the reports on them attacking Iraq were false. Oh, yeah, I said that. Sorry. Uh, Corey, when the military is desperate for people, they'll lower the standards significantly. Yeah, and military recruitment has actually been decreasing over the years. Yes, they would. Uh, v says your playground analogy would be a great hotspot savvy. Oh, yeah. Well, Nick and Nico do the hotspots. I don't know if I'm a... um. If I'm a TikTok kind of person that can do those little vids, like I put things on TikTok, but I don't know if I would be good at that style that Nick and Nico do for Hotspot. They're really good at that. Uh, thank you, Sparky. Denazify Israel. Thank you, Troy. U.S. walks into the same room as Israel. You can't do that. Walks away and leaves money on desk next to Israel. That is a good, uh, that's a good reference there, Troy. Uh, Shani says Pierce Morgan interview with Professor Mirandi did not go well for Pierce. I recommend it, though I generally agree with George Galloway that guests should boycott Pierce's show. <laughs> oh, love it. Thank you, Sparky. Bricks rules. Thank you, New York Varsity. Still think that mainstream media has no teeth. The Pentagon did not know about Israel's attack, but CNN did. Dun, dun, dun. Interesting. Thank you, Cobra. Condemning Kamas is like condemning Nat Turner's slave rebellion. Yeah, and people have made that, that comparison, you know? Uh, thank you, Aspen Fallen. Sabs, have you ever asked Professor Mirandi on? He does a lot of Indo Journal podcasts and is amazing. I haven't. I can reach out to him. I will do that. Uh, thank you, uh, QWERTY. Pierce Morgan is not simply naive on this conflict. He is actively doing pro-Israel propaganda. He's a propagandist for British finance capital. Bingo. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Cynical. Biden supported separate but equal. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Famo says, I hate bullies. Yeah. Thank you. Where's the love? Damn right. Black folks, get your babies out of those military recruiting offices. That's right. No, this is not your battle. Remember what Muhammad Ali said. Remember what he said? He said, why should I go fight in the Vietnam War, killing people abroad for a country that doesn't even fight for me, right? Uh, thank you, Bryn. The Ewoks are definitely the hoodies. <laughs> oh, man. The Ewoks. All right, guys. Oh, yeah, we do have this bonus story. Quick bonus story. I do want to make sure I cover this as well. Also, in reference to Israel and Gaza, if you have not heard, you know, as many times as Joe Biden said he supported a two state solution, you know, that was all theater. Behind the scenes, he was actually saying something different. And we actually saw that reflected at the UN Security Council meeting. The US actually vetoed a resolution backing UN membership for Palestine. Let's go ahead and bring up this vote here. Usual suspects. So those in favor, favor of the draft resolution, please raise their hand. Those against? Abstention. So you see that? Same person, same guy. And he actually is the alternate for the United States. So him, it's either him or it is uh, the other woman. Abstentions. The draft resolution has not been adopted owing to the negative vote of a permanent member of the council. This vote does not reflect opposition to Palestinian statehood. 
It remains the U.S. view that the most expeditious path toward statehood for the Palestinian people is through direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority with the support of the United States and other partners. We believe this approach can tangibly advance Palestinian goals in a meaningful and enduring way. Will those in favor? Clown, clown crap, right? It's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I told you, who do they put out in the front to do the dirty work? It's usually someone black or another person of, of a person of color, right? So it's him and that other woman. And they do this with uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre. Now listen to this. Israel's UN ambassador, he's going to tell you why he doesn't think that Palestine can be a full member of the UN. Listen to this garbage, you guys. It's a very important principle stated in Article 4 of the UN Charter is, and I quote, membership in the United Nations is open to all peace-loving states. Peace-loving. What a joke. Does anyone doubt that the Palestinians fail to meet these criteria? This is Israel talking about their self. Uh, is it peaceful to remove Palestinians from their homes in the West Bank? Is it peaceful to encage Palestinian people in Gaza in an open air prison to restrict the type of food that they get, to give them dirty water, to control the air, the land and the sea? to occupy the Palestinian people, is that peaceful? Is it peaceful to imprison Palestinians when you're looking for one person who's Palestinian and you go to their home and they're not there and you take the family member and imprison them instead? Is it peaceful for the IDF to beat Palestinian kids in the street? Is it peaceful for the IDF to walk into these mogs and beat Palestinian people? Are any of these things peaceful? Most of the videos that you have seen where a lot of the hate, hateful rhetoric is coming from has been from Israel. A lot of the accusations, I say all these accusations that they have against the Palestinian people, it's actually about their self. They want to blame Hamas for some of the things that they're actually doing. So this is, a, it's a joke. It is an absolute joke. Anyone listening right now, if you sit here and you actually think that Israel is peaceful, you got to be kidding me. Now, the State Department was questioning about this. So we bring in this guy. I want you to listen to what he says as to why no Palestinian statehood for the Palestinian people. United States uh, is voting no on this uh, proposed Security Council resolution. Okay. As an yeah, expert of the UN, I, I will lead. also yeah. I will also just so note um, that due to statutory requirements, such um, an admission of statehood would also require the United States to cease its funding to the United Nations. Um, but uh, the U.S. is committed to intensifying its engagement on this issues with the Palestinians and the rest of the region, not only to address the current crisis in Gaza, uh, but to advance a political settlement here that we think can create a path to Palestinian statehood and membership in the United Nations. All right. Pause for a second. They're going to try to negotiate with the Palestinian people that are starving right now. The Palestinian people who are just trying to survive because Israel has blocked humanitarian aid from getting to them. Then uh, you said the most you believe the U.S. believes that the most expeditious way to statehood is through direct negotiations. So. Just to make sure, I just kind of, I just Googled expeditious. Marked by or acting with prompt efficiency. How many years has it been since Oslo? Isn't the most expeditious way to Palestinian statehood to have a, to have some kind of a, 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 an announcement or a, a, or a determination um, by the UN? Unless you're not, unless don't you don't really so. mean expeditious because expeditions means 
fast. We do mean uh, expeditious, and we do uh, not believe that the uh, pathway through New York and the United Nations is the best path forward. And as I so noted, uh, such action through the United Nations would statutorily require the United States to cease its funding to the UN. That's certainly not something uh, we're interested in doing either. Uh, cease its funding to the UN? I'm sorry, what does the UN do again? Someone tell me. What does the UN do again? Okay, uh, the UN is not really enforcing any damn thing. Okay, the UN sees a genocide happening right in front of them. What does the UN actually do again besides write these strongly worded letters? What do they do? What do they do? Oh, that would help. That would hurt our funding towards the UN. You're just giving billions to Ukraine. You're giving money to to to, to Ukraine. You're giving money to Israel. Maybe you should reprioritize. Your funding. I take your point on the number of years it has been since Oslo, but this is something that we will continue to pursue uh, because we so firmly believe that it is in uh, not just in the interest of the Palestinian people, but it is a key uh, tenant of establishing uh, peace and security for the people of Israel as well. Thanks. Humaira. Hmm. You see, the security is always about the security for more so the people of Israel, right? So shout out to Derenik here because he actually called this out. He said, I thought the Biden administration had been saying they wanted a two-state solution. Yeah, this is all theater. And I tried to tell you guys about this the other day when I was interviewing Max Blumenthal. This article here from The Intercept let the cat out the bag. Leaked cable show the White House opposes Palestinian statehood. Despite Biden's pledge to support a two-state solution, the cables argue that Palestine should not be granted UN member status. They say whatever you want to hear when they're talking to the media. Because remember, Joe Biden is up for re-election. He's just still trying to get votes. <laughs> so they're going to tell you whatever you want to hear. He's a politician. But behind the scenes, he doesn't even want them to have a statehood. It's all a joke. And honestly, had it not been for the massive protests, he probably would have never even told the media that he wanted them to have two state solution, which two state solution at this point is a joke. You let all these years go by, the Oslo Accords, all these, these decades go by, and now you want to try to bring up a two-state solution? What a joke. What a joke. Let's go to the comments here. Uh, QWERTY, thank you for the super chat. Ethno states have a record, a great record of being peaceful. I don't know if you are being sarcastic or not, QWERTY. I don't know. Uh, thank you, Cooper. Media loves mentioning World War III, implying a comparison of the world and its political and military climate today to that of the 1940s. But it, is that really accurate or helpful? Seems sensationalist to me. Good point. And thank you, Courtney. The UN ain't shit. Hashtag Sabs 2024. <laughs> okay. Courtney still remembers that, huh? This is a statement I made about it. <laughs> They don't do They're They're not. They're not. <laughs> oh, man. All right, guys, we do have one more story for you. Uh, there was actually a panel debate uh, between Dave Smith uh, Prager, the guy who started Prager U, uh, Batya, who you've seen before. They're on the Zionist side, of course. Uh, and Jank Uger. I did not think I would have to talk about Jank again since I talked about him the other day. But this debate was really, it's something else. We're going to talk about a part of this. It's Zero Hedge Presents, the Israel-Iran-Palestine debate. And Sagar and Jetty is actually uh, moderating this debate. So really interesting. Let's dive into this. There's some funny moments. We got to get into it. States. But before we get to started and I introduce everybody, we've got a quick word from our sponsor, Dave Smith. Why don't you take it away? Oh, thank you very much. Well, if you are tired of all the virtue signaling when you're simply trying to buy products, I know I am. Progressive corporate America continues to post, push messaging that further alienates conservative Americans, all while eroding the future of the American dream. It's prominent all over the country. Retailers selling, check, uh, selling 
Uh, sorry, selling tuck-friendly bathing suits to children, corporations pressuring their employees to conform to woke DEI policies, banks canceling customers, uh, users being deplatformed by big tech or, or gender ideology being forced on you. Thankfully, we don't have to fund these companies any longer. With our hard-earned dollars with Public Square, we now have a solution. It's simple. Stop spending your money at companies that hate you and shift your dollars to companies who love truth and our country, our Constitution, at publicsquare.com. So that's the company that actually sponsored this debate. I'm just going to go forward a little bit. Sorry, I forgot about that part. And uh, so I think with that, I'm going to offer some opening statements. I'll give everybody, let's say, a couple of minutes, like three minutes or so. And uh, so with that, I think we should go ahead and start. We'll start with you, Dennis. Dennis Prager is the founder of Prager University and the host of the Dennis Prager radio show. On the topic, is Israel's invasion of Gaza morally justified? Let's start there, which is the stated topic. Go ahead, sir. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, all who are watching. By the way, which is my camera? Because I want to talk to the audience. Go ahead. I think it's is that it over there? Right Hi, everybody. There all right. Thank you for having me. The the dilemma in the Middle East has always been the same from the beginning of Israel's creation in 1948, and that is that its neighbors do not want there to be a Jewish state in their midst. That is the entire problem. One side, as I have put it all of my life, one side wants the other side dead. And in case you were in doubt about it, October 7th should have made that clear. Now, uh, Professor Morandi has already cleared this up and made it very clear. It's not that, again, this guy is, is generalizing. Uh, it's not that they want Jewish people dead. It's more so that they want the apartheid regime uh, to cease to exist. Got to debunk here. If you really want to have a, a serious moral debate, and one should, and you're not already committed to the anti-Israel side, I have a question. And I think this question more or less clarifies everything. If Israel announced we are disarming and we will fight no longer, what would happen? If the Palestinians said we are disarming and we will fight no longer, what would happen? If you are intellectually honest, you know the answer to the question. The day after Israel announced it disarmed, you would have an October 7th of the entire population of Israel. There would be finally an actual genocide, not the false accusation of Israeli genocide in Gaza. This guy is disgusting. So this is the Prager guy. I do just want to jump in here for a second. And just a reminder, I think Prager is, is, is some religious. I think it's like a Christian type of thing because I've seen Prager ads uh, before. So if that is the case, then he most likely might be a Christian Zionist. I don't know for sure, but it seems like he might be heading down that lane, right? Just listening to his rhetoric. And if he is a Christian Zionist, and I would argue there are more of them in this country uh, than Jewish Zionists, then this is exactly what he wants to happen. Because you have to remember what they're taught, especially in, in reference to the Bible, is that you need to actually have uh, the Jewish people in the, the location that they're in right now in order for you know, the, the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So in, in order for the Christian Zionists to feel that the prophecy that has been told to them has been fulfilled, what is happening with Israel needs to happen. So you have to understand that so that you understand why he has the talking points that he has. If the Palestinians announce that the next day or perhaps the next week, there would be peace. This is the only time, as the little excerpt I saw when I spoke at Oxford and debated this issue, this is the only case in modern history where people believe the democracy, the free state, the state with an opposition press, an opposition party, civil rights for all its citizens, including its two million Arab citizens, the, the peace-loving state, the democracy, is the aggressor, and the police state that tortures its opponents, they're the good guys. That is how inverted it is. I have a theory as to why everything is inverted, and I believe it is because it is the one Jewish state in the world. There are 22 Arab states. There are 52 Muslim states. There are 200 states around about that number all over the world. Only one, only one is targeted for extinction. There is no other state targeted for extinction. 
So first of all, like, again, he's lying. He's clearly lying. Who is in power? The Palestinian people are not in power. Israel is the one that is in power. They are the ones that have been the aggressor. Gaza does not have a military. <laughs> like, you kidding me? Are you kidding me? They are the ones pulling people out of their homes in the West Bank. And this guy wants to sit here and pretend like none of these things are happening. He wants to pretend like Israel isn't doing any of these things. And then wants to use religion as an excuse for it. Only the one Jewish state the size of New Jersey. And so that is the issue. One side wants the other side dead, and it has been true since 1948. All right, Dennis, thank you very much. Uh, Cenk, why don't we go to you, uh, founder of the Young Turks? Go ahead. Yeah. So first of all, we should clarify the question, because if we're saying, hey, was Israel right to go in in the first place after October 7th? I say yes, but it depends on how and uh, how long do you stay, how long, how do you conduct affairs, etc. If we're talking about uh, how Israel has conducted this war and whether they should still be in there, that's a hard no. It's not even close. It's uh, been absolutely atrocious what they've done. And not only has it killed over 33,000 Palestinians, uh, with probably a lot more than that inside the rubble, 76,000 wounded, uh, 1.1 million people starving. If you think that uh, that is good for Israel, I think that you ought to have a sanity check. So not only is it devastating for the Palestinians, potentially devastating for the world, as Netanyahu now agitates for a broader war with Iran engulfing the entire Middle East, which will be catastrophic for America and the world. But for Israel itself, if you want a safe haven for Jews, you must stop the occupation. 75 long, brutal years. So it's one thing to say, hey, um, theoretically, Hamas would do this. And by the way, I'm then going to say all Palestinians would do that or all Muslims would do that. That's a dangerous area to go to, right? It's another thing to say, yes, well, while they theoretically don't want our state to exist, we are actually preventing their state from existing. I mean, it's such an ironic argument. Hey, we prevented their state for 75 long years. We prevented them from having freedom for 75 long years. We brutalized them in every uh, possible way. We've humiliated them in every possible way. Number one, we can't believe they're fighting back. Are you serious? We'll talk a lot about this in the debate. But so. Let me pause here for just a second because I want to get you guys' opinion about this. It was really interesting to me that uh, Cenk Uger was a part of this panel debate. I, I was kind of trying to figure out why they didn't have people a part of this discussion that have actually been to Gaza. Like, why didn't they have, and someone mentioned it in the chat, thank you for reminding me, why didn't they have Norm Finkelstein and Max Blumenthal be a part of this debate? Because they've actually, they've been to Gaza. I don't think Cenk has been to Gaza, but they've been to Gaza. Think about that for a second. Were it, it would it people Jews uh, would people have been surprised if Jews fought back against the Germans during World War II? Would that have been terrorism? Is that what it would have been? That's outrageous to say that. Of course, Jews should have been able to fight back against the Germans. Any occupied people should be able to fight back. We can go to uh, Armenians fighting back against the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so those are my uh, original people. I'm Turkish descent. And if you said, well, the Armenians, how dare they? They should have loved the Turks. And they should have said the Turks are the greatest people on earth. And they should have been occupied and accepted their occupation. I can't. Or slave revolts as well. I'm, I'm glad that you acknowledged that, uh, Jenk. I'm glad that you, <laughs> I'm glad he acknowledged that because that, that was, you know, the Armenian uh, uh, genocide as well. But the reality is you got to think about this for a second. What about the slave revolts that have happened? Should those be, that, that's the other thing. Like, do you think Nat Turner was wrong? You see, they don't like it when you use those examples because then it implies that Israel was imprisoning people because they were. I can't believe they fought back. And you know what? When the Turks uh, moved them and killed them, they were just defending themselves. They have a right to defend themselves. Guys, I don't, if you're in that camp, I don't think you understand how biased you sound and how it does not sound to anyone outside of your camp that you're in a rational world. So, if you want Israel to be safe, you must end the occupation. It is not optional. So is the goal here to say, as Netanyahu is clearly saying now, he's saying, I do not want a two-state solution. Permanent occupation means permanent war, permanent terrorism, 
and a disaster for Israel, let alone the Palestinians. Got it. Bacha, why don't you go ahead. Uh, Bacha Ungar Sargon, she is opinion editor at Newsweek, and she's the author of Second Class, How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women, which we have a copy of on the desk <laughs> right over there. She was so kind to give us one. Go ahead, Bacha. You can go ahead. Um, thank you so much. So she's also a Zionist, by the way. I've seen her multiple times. So much for having me. I'm so honored to be here with this panel. Um, <clears throat> are we all in agreement that Israel was just to invade after October 7th? Shank, you agreed with that. Um, Dennis, you obviously agreed with that. I agree with that. Dave, are you in agreement that that was a just... I, I would say, like, Jenk, it depends on what you mean by, by invasion. what followed. But, yeah. Sure, sure. But, but the initial you did with invasion that. itself, you could see that from a just point, that there would, would have, that, that would have been justified based on October 7th, based on had they conducted themselves. There was a way they could, that Israel could have conducted itself that you would have felt comfortable with that as a reaction to October 7th. Is that accurate? Well, I mean, look, if you're spending your opening asking me a question, it's a fairly complex question, but I would certainly say that Israel was more than justified in uh, pursuing and killing anybody who was involved in October 7th. Why don't we cut the questions there? Continue with your opening statement. We'll get to Well, that. Yeah. I think that's very important because um, then we can narrow the scope of the debate. It doesn't have to be about whether the war is just, but whether Israel's behavior since invading mm -hmm. was just and the way that it has carried it out. And I think the answer to that. Let me pause for a second because I have a problem with the vocabulary that's being used. How do you invade a place that you already occupy? How are you invading Gaza if you already occupy the area and the people? So I, I think I think the vocabulary that's used is very important because when you say that word invade, it makes it seem like Gaza is its own separate thing and that Israel has no control over it. When in fact, Israel does have control over it. It is very clearly yes, because um, first of all, the uh, measures that Israel has taken, obviously we look at the destruction and it is horrifying. We see these children, we see women, we see people being impacted in the most horrific, horrific way. And it looks horrible. But the reality is, is that war is horrible. And the thing that we have to determine is, is Israel engaged in a war or in war crimes, right? Is Israel engaged in a justified response to a heinous attack? Or is it going and, and doing things that are beyond the pale? And the evidence seems to suggest that Israel is not only behaving in a way that every other army has behaved in a very similar situation, but in a much more careful way despite the massive massive destruction and the let me let me pause here for a second so you have to understand that has already been debunked multiple people have already reported that they have never seen this type of devastation in any other conflict of what they've seen in gaza doctors have come forward and said about the devastation they've seen in Gaza. They said it is like no other. When you try to remove all the hospitals so that the people who are injured cannot be treated, when you get rid of the academic institutions, when you kill over a hundred journalists, when they're killing elderly people, when they're killing babies and saying the babies are also Hamas, when you have the video footage of the IDF soldiers saying we have to get rid of all of them because they're animals and there is no such thing as a civilian. What are you talking about, Batya? You guys know people like Batya, people like Barry Weiss, people like Jerry Seinfeld, Hakeem Jeffries, Richie Torres. These people are doing this and they're saying these statements because that is what they're paid to do. There's no way you can sit there, Batya, and see all of those children that have been killed and I told you, I think the number is way higher than 30,000 people. If you count the people that are buried under the rubble, there's no way you can sit there and say that that is a just response compared to what happened to the Israelis that were at the festival on October 7th, which some of them were killed by the IDF. Even Israel itself had to confirm that. So there's no way you cannot make that comparison.
The evidence for that is in the efforts that they have made, the millions and millions of phone calls they make. You understand that Israel telegraphs to the enemy before every single thing that it does in Gaza. They're literally giving away the plan in order to get civilians out of harm's way. Now, lies. First of all, when you heard from the civilians and even on CNN, they talked about this number. Of the civilians said they had no warning. A number of civilians said on the news that when they were told to evacuate, when they got to the evacuation exits, Israel was bombing those too. So stop it, Batya. Stop it. Can more be done? More can always be done. But have they gone further than any army in human history? The answer is yes. The number 33,000. Last week, Hamas put out um, a, a statement on Telegram in which they said they cannot account for 11,000 of those. So Hamas itself reduced the number to 22,000, which means that if you take the number of Hamas soldiers who have been killed, right? Israel says 13,000. Hamas itself in February admitted to 6,000. We're talking about a ratio of combatants to non-combatants that, again, simply has not been seen in urban warfare. All of these things, I think, come together to suggest that despite the enormous devastation, and I'm with you on that emotionally, we have to analyze this objectively and conclude that if you are saying 33,000 as the number of dead, you are mourning the butchers. And I think that's shameful. I think it's really important that people who are mourning the civilians make sure that they are careful, that they are not mourning exactly what we all have agreed on, which is that the butchers, Israel had every right, not just every right, but a moral right and a moral obligation to kill them. Got it. Thank you. So I guess people shouldn't mourn the dead IDF members either, uh, Batya, right? And I don't think that Batya's numbers are correct either. These people are paid to preach propaganda. Why do you see this woman pop up everywhere to talk about this issue since October 7th? Why do you see her face popping up everywhere to talk about this issue ever since October 7th? Propagandists got to get out there and push the Zionist narrative. Thank you, Baja. Dave, uh, you can go ahead. Comedian, and he's host of the Part of the Problem podcast. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, sure. Well, since we have a short opening here, I, I think I'll just respond to a couple things that I, I've heard you guys say so far. So one of the things that I notice uh, almost in every war is that it kind of drives people down to this most base collectivist understanding of what's going on here. You know, this side is bad, this side is good, and no one really seen, sees the nuance that there are individuals involved. So for example, in just, just in the war uh, between Ukraine and Russia, you see people who have the Ukrainian uh, flag in their Twitter bio, and they celebrate when there's a, a Russian defeat, never really considering the fact that many of these Russian young boys were conscripted into this army and that they're victims too and you know when mr prager says one side wants peace and the other side wants to kill all of these people it's a very convenient collectivist way to look at things but the reality the objective reality of the situation here is that there have been atrocities on both sides committed against the other side this is true throughout the history of the existence of israel this is true before the existence of the state of israel when with the zionist settlers the british the arabs there were atrocities committed on all sides and th to say that everybody as if or, or to imply that everybody on the Israeli side just wants peace and everybody on the Palestinian side just wants that is just not true there are the atrocities are not they're not anywhere near the same though we went through the numbers on this show multiple times when you look at the numbers you look at the deaths you look at the unemployment rate you look at all of these different factors the Palestinians have had way more atrocities than the Israelis have had the numbers aren't anywhere near close at all, at all. So when people say there are atrocities on both sides, break down what those atrocities are and make sure you explain to people how significantly different those numbers are. Because we're talking about 
You look at 2022 and it may say that, oh, 100 Israelis had been killed. But then the comparison, when you compare it to the Palestinians in Gaza, is like 4,000, 5,000. The numbers are nowhere near close. So what's obvious, which is to be expected, when you have one side that is in a position of power and the other side is the, the position of being occupied. So obviously it is going to be that way. Lots of Palestinians who just want peace and there are lots of Israelis who want their land and are quite willing and will openly explicitly say they're willing to do whatever it takes to take their land. Now to your point about how, I mean, you said every single strike they're warned. No, that is just not true. That's objectively not true. They do warn sometimes, but then you also, that also leads to the question of, does that mean that whatever you do is just okay? The reality is that this is not just a war like any other war. And that doesn't mean other wars are justified necessarily, but there's a very big difference in this war compared to almost any other war we could think of. And the major difference that I see is that Israel has dominated the Palestinian people since at least 1967, and we could probably go back before that. Let me just say this. If we look at things in not a collectivist way, and we recognize that there are, group, there are individuals, and these individuals make up different groups, let's say we have the group that is Hamas, made up of individuals, but that's Hamas. Within that group, we have the militant Hamas, and we have the political arm of Hamas. They are different. We also have, um, we have Israel, which is made up of its citizens. We have different political parties within Israel. Okay, the, let's take this one group for a second, the innocent Palestinians. I hope both of you would concede that such a group does exist. There are some people on the pro-Israel side who will explicitly tell you that that group does not exist. I think yeah. if we're being honest with ourselves, there is no group that has been more victimized than the innocent Palestinians. And at a certain point, maybe we ought to think about that group. Nobody has been through it worse than that group, the innocent Palestinians. And at a certain point, I think the question needs to be asked, does Israel have a right to do what it's been doing to the innocent Palestinians for many, many decades now? Very, thank Let's pause here for a second so I can answer that question. Obviously, no, they do not have the right to do uh, what they have been doing. I, I just want to show you the numbers because that part there, and we'll come back to that in just a second, that part there uh, from Dave, I, I really want to show you the difference with the numbers because when you say there are atrocities on both sides, I'm sorry, but when it comes to this particular conflict, let me pull this up here. In particular, again, I, I mean, this is going back to 2008, okay? So death is red, excuse me, injuries are red, blue are deaths. Let me zoom out just a second so you can see it a little bit better. So you can see the difference here. The Palestinian side is on the left. The Israeli side is on the right. This is going through the years. 2008, you can see 2009, 2010. 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. Who has higher numbers here, folks? We're talking about 2014, over 19,000 Palestinians, over 2,000 Israelis. 2015, 2016, 2017. We come to 2018, over 31,000 Palestinians compared to 130 Israelis. So you can see the difference. So yes, there have been, there, Israel has, has suffered almost nearly nowhere near, nowhere near. So red is injuries and blue is deaths. You can see it here, total death from 2008 to 2020. This is just the 2020, over 5,590 Palestinians, 251 Israelis. And that's just to 2020. So you can see the difference. It's just, it's nowhere near the same, nowhere near. Let's bring this back up. 
Thank you guys very much. You all stayed within the time limit, which is actually incredible. And Bhatia, you did steal a little bit of my thunder because, and I'm big glad that you answered that question, Dave and both Jenk both responded in that way about how exactly what the question and the superimposed upon that is that do we agree that Israel at least either had a right or was justified in taking some action as a result of October 7th. So my question, I think, to both of you, and both of you can feel free to chime in after uh, both of them has responded, is if we look at the original statement statements um, for the war and for the invasion is that the Israeli military was supposed to accomplish a few objectives. Number one, they had to destroy Hamas, the militant terrorist organization. Two, they had to lead to the release of the hostages. And three, they had to make sure that an October 7th could never happen again. So in the conduct of the war so far, do you believe that they have been successful with those objectives? Dennis, why don't you go ahead and go first? None of us knows yet. Israel is being prevented by much of the world. And it, 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 it's, I feel. Pause. First of all, none of us knows yet. Yes, we do know. Has Israel rescued the hostages? No. Okay. That was one of the missions they were supposed to do. Israel has been, what do you say, blocked or something by the rest of the world? Did anybody stop giving Israel weapons? The U.S. government is still giving Israel weapons. Germany, I think, is after us, number two, giving them a lot of weapons. Who, who blocked Israel when they're still killing people? Yes, there was the hearing at the ICJ, but the ICJ absolutely has no power to enforce. You got the, the, the UN Security Council. You have the U.S. representative raising their hand to veto every time they get to go around. We're the ones holding it up. They're not blocked by the world. It doesn't matter if all these other countries at the UN Security Council vote against Israel. If one of the most powerful countries, which is the United States, and that's the one that's given them most of the weapons, is still voting in support of Israel. Prager. These are the kind of things, it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. This is propaganda being fed 101. And I don't know, maybe they need to stop doing these debates. I'm honestly wondering about this. The number of time I've seen these debates on Pierce Morgan show and now this debate, now I'm starting to wonder, are these debates actually helping? Are they doing more harm? Are they spreading more propaganda? I don't know. You guys can let me know in the chat. But on this entire issue, I, I'm, I'm living uh, in a make-believe world the every analogy could have been applied to Nazi Germany. There were innocent Germans who were killed by the Allies in the bombing and in invasions and so on. The, no one denies that. But to point out that there were innocent Germans while the Nazis were in charge is a morally idiotic point. It means nothing. It only means that every innocent German's life that was taken is the responsibility of the Nazis. Every innocent Palestinian life that has been taken is the responsibility of Hamas or Hezbollah. That's it. The, the analogy is perfect. There is one difference between Hamas and the Nazis. And I never called any group in my 40 years of radio Nazi. I never called an individual that other than the Nazis of, of the 1940s. Who is the one that's calling for ethnic cleansing? That is Israel. Who's the one calling the Palestinian people animals? That is, that, that's Israel. Okay, but he's calling Hamas. He's comparing them to Nazi Germany. What? This goes back to, again, who is in the position of power? We always have to bring it back to that question. And what you'll see is obviously the Palestinian people are not in a position of power. If you go back to Nazi Germany, the Nazis were in a position of power. So how can you compare Hamas to Nazi Germany when they're not in a position of power? You can easily debunk this guy. Easily. But there is only one difference between Hamas and the, and the real Nazis of Germany. The Germans hid their atrocities. Hamas boasts and videos them. Bacha, go ahead. Um, I think that they have the IDF also video records. Okay. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Who's on TikTok with the videos. Okay. The IDF. Jesus. I would say destroying Hamas definitely 
they're not going to get every single one, but the idea that Yihia Sinwar will ever breathe open air again seems to me very far-fetched. I think they have driven him underground forever, and, you know, they've cut off the head, and the idea that Hamas will be able to regroup at this point seems to me uh, very unlikely. The release of the hostages, no, they failed on that front. Um, I think they tried. Maybe they could have tried harder. I think, unfortunately, I hate to say this, but I think a lot of them are dead. Um, if they are, it would be because Israel was starving the Palestinian people. Because let's keep it real. When they refused to let food go into Gaza, they were refusing to give food to the hostages as well. Don't know what to tell you there, Baya. So let's say about that. But um, I think on that, they've obviously failed. And uh, as to another October 7th, um, I think a lot of that has to do with what we're seeing now um, in terms of the realignment happening um, in the Middle East to where you see Saudi Arabia um, clinging to the idea that they, too, will be able to join the Abraham Accords at some point. The, the moderate Sunni and Gulf states rushed to Israel's defense, amazingly, to, to protect them from these Iranian rockets. And to me, that is, you know, I mean, I, I don't think this is a moral question so much as a strategic one. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get into where does the United States fit into all this? Where do we I'm want the United will. States to fit into yes. all this? But from that point of view, and an Iran-backed um, October 7th, um, should it happen again, is going to be to happen in a very different Middle East, one in which Israel has a lot of support from the Arab nations, and that makes it less likely as well, I believe. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just feel like people shouldn't have to come in and support and back up Israel when they started a lot of this in the first place. If you're the one out there punching people on the playground, why did the rest of uh, the kids that are swinging on the swings and sliding down the slide why do they have to come in and help to your defense when you're the one throwing the first punch? Answer that question for me. Answer the question. If you're the kid on the playground throwing the first punch, why do the other kids on the swings mind their own business have to come in and rescue you when someone wants to deliver a punch back at you? Not their responsibility. You got yourself into this mess. It's your responsibility to get yourself out of it. I'm, yeah. so, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm blown away by the statement that Mr. Prager just made that the only difference he can see between the Nazis and Hamas is that the Nazis hid their atrocities. So if that's the only difference you can see, I just, I have a few others uh, that pop to mind. Um, the Nazis were a government. The Nazis had an army. The Nazis had an air force. The Nazis had submarines. The Nazis controlled from France to Poland in all of Europe, whereas Hamas can't even control Gaza effectively. I mean, I you see the comparison there. That's a really good point that Dave Smith brought up is the fact that, again, they have no position of power. <laughs> oh, boy. Just, I, I find the statement that you can't see any differences between the Nazis killed you see a over. Difference? Well, OK, but hold on. But you said that wasn't what you said. What you said is that you can't see a difference. The Nazis. Okay. OK, but the not. Yes, I see an, a moral difference. The Nazis killed over 10 million people outside of the war conflict. Just in terms of people that they killed, let alone the tens of millions of people who you might hold them responsible for. So, yes, I do see a moral difference between the two. I'm not saying October 7th was in horrifically immoral. But if you're going to say, do you see a moral difference? That would be like if somebody had murdered two people and you went, I see no difference between that and the Nazis. Uh, OK, yes, there's, they're both immoral, but there's enormous differences between the two. Now, to the, to the other point of the idea of can Israel eliminate Hamas, even if they were, which I don't think is feasibly possible, that they eliminated everybody who is a member of Hamas. I mean, in order to do this, you would have to look at, you know, if, if the images of Gaza City aren't enough, you would have to look at images five times over of that. And this is going to result in just slaughtering innocent people, not to mention the excess mortality where hundreds of thousands of people are going to die as a result of this in the future. But even then, you would just be dealing with another Hamas-like group. Because if you don't understand what creates this problem to begin with, look, this is the problem. This happens all throughout history, all throughout the world. If you want, there's a reason why the Nazis only rose 
First, it was after we imposed Versailles, but then, as you know, it was after the Great Depression when there was hyperinflation. When things go terrible, that's when the worst, most violent extremist groups rise. Dennis, and that's what yeah. the future is going to be, unfortunately. Can I respond just very briefly sure, to that? And Dennis can go. Um, um, yeah. Something really staggering has happened in Gaza since October 7th, which is there have been protests against Hamas for the first time in, well, there were protests actually recently in 2019, but they were quashed by Hamas in a very aggressive, violent way. But the people of Gaza, the innocent people of Gaza, yes, who you mentioned, are speaking out against Hamas because Hamas is stealing their food and their aid. And they are seeing, I mean, they've known all along the role Hamas plays in their oppression. But the fact that people... Pause. So what Banya is doing right now is she's actually trying to deflect. She's trying to put the blame on Hamas for the Palestinian people's oppression. You see how she did that little pivot there? Notice how she did that little, little pivot? I haven't heard this from anybody who has been to Gaza say this whack rhetoric that this woman just said. The people have started rising up protesting against Hamas. I have not heard one person who has been to Gaza say this rhetoric that this woman just said on this panel. I don't know where she's getting this information from. She probably just made it up. Probably all her Zionist friends like, let's see how we can make this up. Okay, so you mean to tell me people who are starving People were eating grass, as someone mentioned in the comments. People were struggling for food. They got time to rise up and go protest. Get out of here, Batya. Not on this channel. Not on this channel. And another thing, notice how she put the oppression on Hamas. I will say this for the 100th time. Hamas is not in power. It is Israel that is occupying the people in Gaza, not Hamas. It is Israel that controls the resources, the food. What types of food can go into Gaza? They won't even allow them to plant olive trees. You guys know this? You know all the different things that you can do with olives? Let me, let me defend the actual oppressor by actually calling the oppressed the oppressor get out of here it's like the same rhetoric that people would make go back during the civil rights movement well you know the reason why those black people are in that position is because you know i mean they just didn't choose to get better education or do well in school so they can get a good job. That's why they're in that position or what you heard in the 90s going forward. Well, they're out there killing each other anyway. And then they wonder why they're poor and why they're struggling. How dare you? I've never seen just so much propaganda spewed in my life. You cannot sit up here and blame the, blame the people that are oppressed for their own oppression, bought ya. I wonder what some of these people would have been like during the civil rights movement. What would you have been saying, bought ya? Would you have gone up to the diner, to the black kids sitting in at the diner doing the sit-ins and say, well, you know, it's your fault, right? What would you have done? What side would you have been on? And, and the cocky guy, the Prager guy and her and all these other clowns out here masquerading like they really care about some human rights. They are Israel first and that is it. And I don't see a lot of people coming to rush to your defense. I wonder why. That is colonizer mentality. Does everybody understand what she just did? She blamed the oppressed for their own oppression. You can watch the rest of this. I can't even listen to any more of this. You can watch the rest of this on breaking points. It's there. 
You can catch it there. It may be on other channels as well. But that that is disgusting to me. That is absolutely disgusting. We'll get to some of the comments. Eric, if we can go back to the first uh, panel, I want to shout out the Telegram channel. Jesus Christ, I can't. I hope you don't have no black friends, Batya. I hope you don't have any black friends. Because, you know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Jesus Christ. Thanks so much, Eric. Okay, guys, I told you I promised you that I would start Telegram channel. You guys have been telling me to do it. I did it. Uh, I just started it actually today. Um, how do I get you guys to do this? Oh, yeah. Um, if you're on Telegram, I know some of you are on Telegram. So if you're on there, let me put it in Telegram. You can follow me on there because what I did, what did I do? I thought I, will it let me know preview channel? Yeah, so my first post, I actually posted the live stream that I was going live tonight. So I'll be adding things in there. And then also, I guess that's a place where you guys can chat as well too. So yeah, especially those of you that are abroad, I think I put the link in the chat. Those of you that are abroad, a lot of you use Telegram. So I know actually this request came from a lot of you. So I did uh, go ahead and start that. So that link should be in the chat. I don't know if I can pin it. Maybe I'll pin it after the show so you guys can take care of that. And then I'll have to add that to my description as well for my videos. I don't think I did it for this one. Oop. All right. Let's go ahead to some of the comments here. Thank you for the uh, super chat, Skylar. The panel needed a Palestinian, e.g. Hamza Sadat. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Prager and Prager plus Smith are Jewish. You should talk with Dave. I do not have contact info with Dave or for Dave. Sorry. Uh, Notori says, trust and believe if Palestinians were white, this wouldn't even happen decades and decades ago. Thank you, Laugh. Batya is a white settler colonialist. Uh, thank you, QWERTY. Dropping leaflets before knowingly bombing civilian targets just because there's a few bad guys is still a war crime. The leaflet argument is baseless. It's a good point. Richie says the IDF have shot many of their own people. There's that too. Thank you so much for the super chat. Dana, Sabby, you are cold peace. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, New York. Sabby, my rule is always engaged, but that freaking dude hurts my argument. That guy's a reverend, question mark. I don't know if he is or not. I have to check uh, the Prager guy. Uh, and thank you, GDNPB. Is calling out a Christian Zionist be anti-Semitic? I don't think so, no. I mean, they, everything is anti-Semitic. Now, you guys notice this? Remember what that that uh, rabbi told Candace Owens, Rabbi uh, Bar Barclay? Remember what he told Candace Owens? He said, the definition is based on emotion, based on feeling. So they can change it whenever they want to. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. Um, I'll take the rumble rant, Eric, and we will head out. No, 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 notorious. Thank you for the rumble rant, Goo. When Fat Sog, what? You guys are so bad. When Fat Sogger uh, said, if we support UN resolution, we would cease funding to the UN. They already ceased funding UNRWA to help Palestinians. You're right. That's a good point. Really good point there. And thank you for this one as well. The most moral army supposedly used a drone quad chopper to play sounds of screaming women and children in a refugee camp so they can lure Palestinians coming to their aid to only execute them. That's so disgusting. Thank you for this as well. Also, Israel refused for the UN to come in and investigate October 7th. If you're innocent, why would you not allow an org controlled by the West to investigate your claims? That's right. Uh, thank you for this. The pro only protest I am seeing is Palestinians walking back to North Gaza against Israel army wishes and gunfire. 
And thank you for this one as well. Also, Israel banned animal feed because they want farm animals to starve and they know Palestinians were even eating animal feed. The only thing I heard regarding Palestinians protesting is the Israeli backed Palestinian Authority who also shoot and arrest Palestinians on Israel's behalf. There you go. And thank you for this as well. Last thing, Israel also went into a non-Zionist Jewish synagogue and started beating up and assaulting those Jews the same they do to Palestinians. Yeah, a lot of these things are all on video, folks, all on video. All right, guys, that is it for me tonight. Uh, this Sunday is my Sunday off, so I'll be back live again uh, Tuesday evening. You'll have clips until then, so I'll see you on Tuesday night. All right. And then Tuesday night, we'll be back on our regular uh, call-in show schedule because because um, I streamed early Thursday. We did the call-in after that live stream, which was earlier. But other than that, guys, I am heading out. It's time to do the damn thing. Have a good weekend, guys. Have a good night. Keep up the fight. Mm -hmm.